uh, I may talk very long. <laughs> so I welcome you all to the final session of the Congress on the duty and power of architectural criticism, which is titled Explicit Criticism. I might have simply started the session by saying that it's so explicit that requires no definition, but it does. Architectural history, theory, and criticism are interrelated. With all due respect to architectural historians of the world, without whose contribution it would have been impossible to conjecture about the theory and put forward a powerful criticism, History doesn't have the power of prediction. Manslow, Jenkins, Southgate argue that history is a reinterpretation of facts, which has happened in the past after a lapse of time. Therefore, history is not the fact itself, and as such, history cannot authentically replace the past. As for the theory of architecture, after the 19th, some declared that best theory is no theory. However, Foucault argues that fields of science without a theory cannot be considered as discipline. Architecture is a discipline. I haven't translated <clears throat> uh, my hypothesis on how architectural theory looks like, but this uh, little chart I use as a base for teaching architectural history to my design students. Here on the right-hand side, we have the anteriority and interiority of architecture, whereas on the uh, other side of the x-axis, we have all these foreign factors affecting architecture. Therefore, it changes, but uh, so does evolution theory. So it is not uh, uh, wrong to change and to adapt times, but in the very center, always remains the uh, Vitruvian theory plus meaning. On the y-axis, uh, architecture always swings between logic uh, and senses, emotions. So I have uh, charted all the progresses lived of with, within modernity and after modernity. The theory of architecture uh, is an organic evolutionary discourse that describes practice and production in the discipline of architecture and uh, has an integrated structure that both, both determines and is determined by the contemporary challenges. These mutual feedbacks between architectural theory and practice form the basis of the development of the discipline. Within this process, criticism plays a major role, provided that all kinds of biases should be avoided and certain variables should be taken into consideration in uh, proper critical text. This one I use uh, for my PhD students in order uh, to uh, talk about criticism. Criticism requires knowledge, no matter whether it is implicit or explicit. All kinds of criticism requires knowledge from uh, the person uh, that wishes to criticize something. He or she has uh, to have uh, a knowledge of philosophical diversity, ontic, epistemic, 
and further apart. And reciprocal uh, interaction between the fields of knowledge and the problem of variables. There are fundamental canons we have to deal with in rendering a criticism for something, for an urban lot, for uh, a building, for an interior, for a landscape, whatever it might be. We need to have a perspective. We have to define the truth and we have to adopt a method and we, of course, have to have a principle in going through such studies. Perspective is the first internal determinant of any text. Work and, of an author may, quite, uh, may be quite different from the actual author. Authorial voice will be present throughout the text as determining its approach or context or point of view or perspective. As for reality, every text not only has been has a perspective, but a perspective on something. That on which text in general has a perspective is reality. In a semantic context, all realities are realities presented in the text. No need for jargon. Every text is not only a perspective on reality, but says something about the reality from this perspective. We have to adopt a method. Without a method, the text can, is not readable. The way in which the text orders the real can be called its method. Often a single author or text will use many methods. If you have a principle, you can criticize something based on the principle. Without a principle, there exists no criticism. No one takes you seriously. Every text is not only an argument by an author about a subject matter, it's also for the sake of some end or purpose or function. An end or purpose or function is present in the text so far as the text has within it something that causes it to function, a principle of its functioning. Such internal principle of functioning can be called principle in a distinctive sense. Without a principle, text cannot function. Imagine, for example, a geometry that lacks definitions, axioms, and postulates. Without principles, there can be no proofs. Therefore, I start discussing all, all these topics and subtopics uh, with my students. I base it on some very important fundamental philosophers like Protagoras, Democritus, Platon, or Aristo, Aristoteles. Uh, depending on the audience, you are rhetoring, you can act differently. Like Bordio said once, I have offered the same course in 27 different media and they were all different. Therefore, yesterday I told you that I, li I write the agenda for, for uh, Yapo uh, Journal. I play the role of the Protagoras, start from my personal individualistic standing. I give sometimes examples from my own life, but since I'm serious with the matter and I want uh, everyone seriously think about it, I follow a different path 
I uh, deal with the uh, analytical and the reflexive. Uh, how can this problem can be? How can this problem be solved? Can it be? And uh, in what ways? And why? Uh, uh, what kind of uh, decisions or vehicles? Whatever. So anyone can follow different route uh, from uh, this uh, uh, diagram from this chart and. Uh, write down uh, a text of criticism. But what I wanted to underline before we go to our, before we listen uh, to the keynote, uh, I wanted to underline the fact that explicit, explicit criticism uh, is actually what we are more often dealing in real life. And uh, you have to have perspective, you have to define a truth, you have to follow the method, and you have to have a principle. Thank you very much for listening to me. And now I think Fernando is going to invite our keynote uh, for her delightful speech, Fernando. Thank you. Uh, How can I get rid of it? Good day, everybody. Um, if you can uh, stop sharing the screen, okay. thank you. Um, well, uh, I just wanted to thank Wilfred really for this uh, incredible um, compromise you assume to to organize and, and, and put this uh, conference uh, into fantastic uh, organization. So thank you very much and, and for the invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Philippa Tamwain. Um, she received uh, he, her PhD at the School of Higher Education Studies of the University of Free State and the, under the supervision of Professor Lossio Gita and Pierre Lauscher. I hope I said it correctly. She is a senior lecturer and head of the School of Architectural Planning and Geomatics at the University of Cape Town. Her focus on technology and construction in architecture is located in the first year architecture studio. Filippa is co-founder and director of Izuba in Africa. After completing her master in architecture professor degree, professional degree in 2006, she taught at the University of Pretoria and University of Johannesburg. She served on the board of the Gauteng Institute of Architects. As a member of the board, Philippe integrated the project team that brought that first International Architecture Festival, ASA 2010, to South Africa. In 2012, she served on the National Judging Panel for the SIA Awards of Merit and Excellence. She was the co-master of program and ceremonies at the second ASA in 2012 architectural conference in Cape Town and gave the keynote at the Nexus Architectural Students Conference in Australia. As a result, in 2013, she served on the national judging panel for the prestigious AFRISAM Sustainability Awards. She's involved as an external examiner in architecture at the University of Pretoria and Namibia University of Science and Technology. Let me finish saying that Philippa is an active presence in the design industry in South Africa with a crippling weakness for shoes, art, and rugby. No less important. Um, well, it's a pressure to, to introduce Philippa, and I, I would also say that 
she will present architectural criticism as a concern with the emergent urbanscapes of the global south. She'll explore how collective decision-making contributes to design processes, enable the architecture to respond to place-based concerns. In conversation with three projects in South Africa, she shifts the dominant paradigm of authorship that is centered in hierarchical, centralized, and vertical decision making towards a design process that engages community and shows how collective participation can nourish architecture, concerned with the concepts of place, identity, and belonging. So, welcome, Philippa. Um, you have your, your space and time. Uh, thank you, Fernando, and thank you, Wilfred, for organizing this and for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone, for coming to um, this talk, and I really appreciate being here. So I'll start off with a confession. So this would not be my usual um, habitat. As you would have heard, I teach mainly structures and construction. So for me, delving into the realm of theory has been a somewhat interesting turn, but we'll see how that goes. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Please tell me if you can see that. Yes. Thank you very much, Fernanda. So in today's presentation, I'd like to structure this talk around how within the conditions that determine and characterize the emerging landscapes in the global south, the reality of architecture as critique is a going concern. As Fernando mentioned in conversation with three projects, we see how architects in an active engagement with the temporalities of a colonial and post-colonial history, governance and oversight and placemaking in informal and marginalized communities position architecture as not only useful and relevant, but as being a, but as being a significant part of addressing and generating place specific societal knowledge systems and concerns. In this urban context, the divide between the processes and interventions behind the conceptualizations of an architectural design and the way in which the realization of that design locates itself and is understood signals the growing malefice of architecture and in turn, the importance of its criticism. The purpose of this talk is to argue that the tension between the view of architecture as being seen as an abstraction from the place in which it emerges and the desire of its critique to embed it in its context is a useful way of framing and understanding the role of the architect in a modern global South, whose urban scape is marked by widespread temporality, informality, social spatial inequality, and limited governance oversight. If architecture is going to maintain any relevance, the values that ground the ethics of architectural critique need to move beyond contextualizing firsthand knowledge of a place to biasing societal needs that are embedded in the processes and concerns that allow for communities to optimally function and operate. The realities that inform the realization of an architectural design should move beyond individual client architect relationships and ground themselves within the particularities of broader decision making processes. Given the scale of processes, or shall we say the scales across which decision making happens, how does architectural design as a creative manifestation fit in? In the complexities of this kind of trickle down of decision and place making how can the architect develop an architecture proposition that moves beyond the quality of the architecture to contribute meaningfully? How does the architecture become a part of those characteristics that define processes and frameworks in an emerging context? While supporting conversations that center around how to develop connections and intersections across scales, in order to position architectural conceptualization as relevant in the tension between the shifting temporality of urban scapes and the abstractions of design. In this tension, although the architecture is seen as an abstraction, if its design process is embedded within the concerns of a place, the architect can bridge the divide between the purpose of its conceptualization and the realizations and the realities of its realization. 
this is just to give you an idea of the kind of context that I'm situated in. We have a context that is um, seen as informal. I prefer to, I like to refer to it as rogue. That has been described quite um, in detail by someone called Edgar Peterson. I'm sorry about that. Just go through these slides. This is a typical South African land um, urban scape. Um, it's quite informal. There's a very, very big social spatial inequality. Um, what usually happens is that people move further and further away from the center of the cities, which is where the economic hub is. It's characterized by urban sprawl, there's sanitation issues, there's fire hazards. The majority of people in South Africa actually live in these conditions. I think we also became quite famous as having a relatively um, problematic urban landscape when the Time magazine put a picture of um, Johannesburg in South Africa on its cover with the caption, the world's most unequal country. It is within this context that an approach to architecture, that we need an approach to architecture that raises questions around governance and the po political, economic, social, and cultural will that generates a qualitative difference for architecture in public and private spheres. In order to shift the focus of its critique towards relationships, connections, synergies, and potential challenges, to show how processes and frameworks that define and determine the function and operation of publicness and public life relate to private endeavors and development thereby contributing to thinking around how these processes and frameworks facilitate the will to excel when making architecture that has symbolic and long lasting value in society. The argument here is for architecture and its critique to acknowledge and respond to the knowledge systems and possibilities that are built in the temporal and at times rogue and at times ad hoc and at times transient nature of an emergent urban landscape. The intrinsic value of an architecture that is grounded in meaning and experiences in order to contribute to solutions for to solutions for in support of societal growth and function is presented in conversation with three projects in South Africa. The projects, the Constitutional Court, Bukuzake and Makasa at the national level, regional level and community level embody the concerns in a specific context and show how knowledges are harnessed to create to create active and dynamic intersections between the individualized client architect relationship and the broader community and society. In all three projects, the architects realize a collective conception of, the arch of an architecture that is socially relevant. This way of designing that is con conceived from the conditions and the characteristics in time and from a place defines how the material and immaterial concerns found in that place give rise to an architecture that is not only relevant, but significant in its contribution. In conversation with each of these three projects, we see how when, when the conceptualization of the architecture becomes a tool to address and work through societal concerns, its critique becomes pivotal in structuring appropriate societal responses within the multifaceted complexities of, urban, of emergent urban landscapes. The first project is the Constitutional Court, um, designed by OMM Design Workshop and Urban Solutions in Johannesburg, South Africa. The Constitutional Court project emerged from a specific moment in the history of South Africa, the birth of a democratic republic. The Constitutional Court building came about as a result of, the inter of an international architectural competition held in 1997. It was won by OMM Design Workshop, led by architects Yanina Masogada and Andrew Macon in Durban, and Urban Solutions led by Paul Vigas, who is both an architect and urbanist in Johannesburg. Their submission highlighted how an architectural intervention can, from a grassroots development perspective, produce an outcome grounded in a consultative process that supports the development of relationships with disenfranchised communities, those who have little or no experience of speaking up, no record, no voice, and no concept of how to make themselves heard. This approach favored the development of an architecture that underscored the tenant of the South African Bill of Rights in its foregrounding of broad public consultation over a prescribed architectural style or notion. I think it's quite important to note at this point that the winners of this competition, which was OMM Design Workshop and Urban Solutions, won the competition without actually submitting an architecture. What they submitted was a process through which architecture could be developed. 
And I quote one of the architects, Yanina. She says, the adjudicators of the competition asked if they would meet with us. They had two concerns. The first thing, the first thing was they still didn't know what the building looked like, <laughs> which is very unusual in a competition. And then they wanted to see if we would participate in a process during the conceptual development of the project, which included some of the adjudicators and the judges, so the constitutional court judges, to ensure that we continued with the same positioning of our architectural response throughout the design development. Because of the architect's focus on a consultative process, a design generator, the architecture itself became a very small part, a very small component of the brief with emphasis being placed on iterative conversation between the architect's understanding of the brief and the processes and frameworks that defined its context in new democratic South Africa. The relationship between the brief and its context is what informed an involving architectural outcome. This outcome grew incrementally beyond the architect and client to include the communities in the immediate urban context and a complex history of a site to show how from a complex and divided past, the idea of an inclusive democratic constitution could emerge and create connections across constructed boundaries that divide and separate society. I think I'll go back to that one. The architect says, basically there is no front elevation to this building. This is the big statement of the Constitutional Court judges. And it's interesting now, looking at when they do show the Constitutional Court in newspaper prints or when there's a hearing or something, they often show an interior image of a court chamber with the judges sitting at the bench. That's the chamber that we usually see on TV. It's not a big intimidating front facade, which is exactly what the intention of it was. It is a fragmented building that is supposed to be something that is completely knitted into the fabric of, it, of the site as an involving an incremental collection of aggregated pieces that together are the constitutional court. It's a street view of the constitutional court. An important conceptual approach in the actual construction of the site was to include as many hands as possible as a tangible realization of an inclusive and democratic architecture that relates to and identifies with as many people as possible. For example, the West Elevation sunscreen, you're looking at it now, was developed through a series of sub-competitions targeted at excavating stories and narratives from the communities in close proximity to the site in order to incorporate living histories and memories. As such, this facade that frames the African steps of sections four and five of the prison is an illustration and, ir and recording of the narratives of prisoners who had spent time on the sites, residents who lived along the site, residents who now live along the site where these atrocities took place, literally across the street from them. The architect says again, this process of recording and hearing and storytelling, I think become, became a very integral part to the court's acceptance into its location by the immediate surrounding communities. So at a very different scale, very different to the urban scale, very different to the architectural scale, the building presents itself within its context as being intimate and personal. Additionally, the inclusion of diverse voices, communities, stories and memories into the architecture has resulted in a national reverence and relevance of the building. The building give rise, gives rise to a sense of pride People who visit the site respect it, not only because of the architecture, but because of its embodiment of inclusive narratives and histories with which they can relate and identify. The series of artworks in the Constitutional Court. It's a full bench of judges, interior shots. I think now is a good time to note that in South Africa, we protest quite a bit. So there's a lot of protest culture in South Africa. And, and, and the one fascinating thing to note about the constitutional court, the constitutional court complex, is that no matter how big or how, um, let's call it riotous, the protests are, this site in Johannesburg is completely untouched. No one steps on it. No one um, sleeps on the pavement. There's no fence. Every other building around this site is big corporates with large fences and security. There is no fence, there is no gate. 
and no one actually desecrates the space. And I think the gravitas of the building and the reverence for the building and the site is because it was developed in consultation with a very, very broad community. One can navigate the constitutional court without a guided tour and without paying for the right to access a symbol of the birth of an inclusive and democratic society. It is in this accessibility that the evolving and incremental nature it is in this accessibility that the evolving and incremental nature of the architecture can be experienced as a place that signifies a moment in time where there was a feeling of upliftment and achievement that needed to be celebrated and expressed alongside the seriousness of what the South African Constitution, the South African Constitution could and had accomplished. The architecture gave expression to unexpressed emotions and hopes in a physical form. And its critique therefore must there and its critique therefore must accommodate the, the democratic design process that brings with it a gravitas that does not seek to intimidate or elevate the building. Rather, the gravitas of the building lies in its inherent accessibility as a place and a symbol, historically, socially, culturally, and spatially. It is this form of accessibility that signals the clarity of intent behind the design and development of an architecture that is relevant across South Africa. The architecture of the Constitutional Court is a, manif is a manifestation of conversations that were going on at that time. The next project is on a regional level. And this is a difficult project to talk about because it's actually, there is no real architecture, but that will become clear as we go along. The next pro project is Vukuzake. In South Africa, where you have almost 230 service delivery protests a day, there is a need to develop solutions that address the need for rapid delivery of services and infrastructure in marginalized community. This need is set in an urban landscape that is characterized by sprawl because municipalities continually provide social housing further and further away from the city. This has meant that the need to deliver infrastructure into these communities to make them viable, to make them functional is immediate and urgent. As an example, in Durban, where Vuvuzake originates, there is a need for over 2000 community buildings, such as clinics, schools, fire stations, police stations, and community halls. Service delivery of, of infrastructure in communities is limited by various problems. One of these problems, and it is a significant problem, is the inefficiency of heavily bureaucratic frameworks of procurement and the complexities of irregular, of irregular fiscal oversight and management. The challenge, how does the architect conceptually take the design of these types of public buildings and beneficially implement them? What processes does the architect put in place to ensure that the architecture is not only useful, but that it addresses deeply problematic governance and urban realities? These questions ask for solutions. Not, that not only intersect with the particularities of place, they ask for solutions that are grounded in the determinants that define that place. Bubuzake as an architectural response adopts a system that can simply and easily support people who have existing skills in the construction industry whilst, con whilst considering the economy of how buildings are built. In Vukuzake, the architect consolidates research and observation about a lack of critical thought offered by the city authority regarding the state of actual urban development in South Africa. He develops systems for the delivery of an alternative building typology by offering a framework in which the construction process can be harnessed to not only address the problematics of the bureaucracy of procurement logic and processes, but also the immediate and dire need for job creation and economic empowerment. The proposed delivery system combines sensitive inclusive site planning and intensive local labor for site preparation with simultaneous simple prefabricated building component production. The intention behind developing a component-based building system that can be delivered through small to medium-sized businesses aims to deliver through basic fabrication systems that can be easily adopted and replicated as, sim as stimulated local economy through viable procurement and construction processes in which the single function of the architecture as a thing incorporates processes that are coordinated to fit seamlessly together when they arrive on site, while also allowing for independent production of parts prior to site works. So what we see is the architect, which is Richard Stratton from Coop Design, starts to go through different iterations of what you can do on site, how this can be done on a small scale within the community 
to provide obviously empowerment for the community, but also to circumvent the, the bureaucratic tender processes. So in principle, the, the architectural contribution, if we're to be quite purist about it, would be the framework. And what happens with these frames is that these frames can be manufactured within the community by community members. They can be stored, packed away by the municipalities so that you can start to deliver quite rapidly buildings. What happens in South Africa, to give you a bit of background, is the procurement process happens on a year to a year and a half tender process. Once that process is over, the project stops and they have to wait another six months before the project reopens. So you can start to see where the service delivery problems come in. What Richard does with this system is that he tries to circumvent that process. You front load your material to the front of it, and you can start to roll out buildings even though the tender process is over. So that's basically a diagram of how that process would work. In quoting the architect, Richard says about Vukuzake, the conceptualization of Vukuzake is promised on maximizing the econ economic benefit of the community for whom the building is provided. Simply employing people through the building process and then leaving them jobless after the building is completed is pointless. It, it is sought at every opportunity to generate economic opportunity through the manner by which the site is developed. The pursuit of form as a drive of architecture is becoming unpopular. The austerity of global economies is fast marginalizing the indulgence of architecture in pure form. Architecture is assessed in terms of, its, in, in terms of the opportunity it creates, the maximization of resource and return. Closed loop production guides where opportunity exists. Vukuzaka shows how architecture as a practice can present an opportunity for pursuing a wide range of applicable or relevant solutions to what is in essence an economic and governance problem. The, the competitization of the construction process in this instance directly embeds itself within the community in which the architecture is located. In this project, the role of the architect extended beyond the architecture into the realm of processes and frameworks that define that context. The system developed in Vukuzaka not only provides for much needed public infrastructure, it activates an environment, act active activates an environment in which communities are resourced and supported through economic empowerment and skills development. The architecture or the architecture solution in this instance makes a meaningful contribution on a very personal level because it allows for the people in the community to take charge not only of the conceptualization of the architecture, but of the procurement and construction processes through which it is delivered. Although there is no real architecture, the systems and solutions developed are architectural. Bukuzake in its support of small businesses and sustained quality jobs is an architecture that, that is concerned with the econo economic freedom of people, of the people for whom public service delivery buildings are intended. I'll move on to the third uh, project that I'm looking at. And this project um, was initiated and is run by someone called Clint Abrams. He's a colleague of mine at the University of Cape Town in the School of Architecture, Planning and Geomatics. He's also a PhD student. And I've referred to this as Clint Abrams and Emergent Common Spaces because it is a collaborative project. Clint Abrams is an architect and embedded researcher who took up a full-time position in 2017 at the School of Architecture, Planning and Geomatics at the University of Cape Town. He started in 2008 with a nonprofit organization called Studio Light to do some community work in the suburb of Makassar, in which he grew up. Through Studio Light, he set up in collaboration with young adults in the community a design build exhibition entitled Makassar, Who We Are. This exhibition showed through representation the this exhibition showed how through representation, the community could shift the dominant narrative about place and placemaking that ma marginalizes the embedded knowledge about materials and materiality in communities such as Makassar. The exhibition set the stage for what Clint refers to as a rescripting of the social spatial narratives and how this process critically engages with the post-colonial challenges of previously displaced communities in South Africa. It is worth, it's worthwhile mentioning that this project won the 2019 UCT Creative Works Award. Some of the workshops that Clint was running with the young people in Makassar.
in 2019, Clint, assisted by 10 of his uh, by 10 of his second year students used found objects to construct exhibition installations that showcased street phot photography produced by young adults in the community. The exhibition showed images that told and retold stories of Makasa from the lived perspective of youth in that community. The exhibition was housed and moved across different sites in Makasa. This is the exhibition in the Makasa library, but you saw what before was um, in one of the communal spaces in Makasa. It became the catalyst that started a series of intergenerational conversations in response to the images on show. The, the conversations around shared or common understandings of Makasa as a material and immaterial concept and earth the need for a common space where conversations around building community resilience through sto storytelling could continue. In July of that year, students from UCT's um, School of Architecture, Planning and Geomatics, from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, from RWTH and Aachen, from the Peter Byron School of Art at the, Applied, at the University of Applied Sciences in Dusseldorf, joined forces with Studio Light to collectively design and construct a, com a communal space in Makassar. This is an image showing so usually what happens in these scenarios is you have the experts coming into a community and training people. This studio or this workshop worked the other way around. If you had students going and architects going into the community and being schooled about construction techniques and materiality by members of the community, which was a very interesting way of starting to look at how you intervene within communities. The communal space was, was designed and built through the through a, co a collaboration called Emergent Common Spaces as a summer winter school and was funded by DAAD. Clint Abrams, through the collaboration, explored with the students and various colleagues and architects the intergenerational practices of self-made constructions and how these practices informed and embedded the materiality and architectural tectonics that to be found in Makassar. Clint Abrams argues that through engagement with emergent architectural tectonics of self-made constructions, we can make visible marginalized knowledges in order to develop urban landscapes that better serve and represent the particularity of place and the communities that live in them. The communal space grounds itself in the understanding of making in Makassar and develops on the intersections between stories and understanding in the community. The conceptualization of the architecture through the knowledge about making in the community generates what Clint argues is a form of restorative architecture. A reading of the process that leads to this restorative architecture shows how the architect, as an expert citizen, relinquishes control of the conceptualizations of the architecture to the citizen expert, the community. The design process through which the architecture emerges are therefore informed by the local knowledge systems that are embedded in the stories and narratives of the community. And the architect's role is thus limited to the realization of this in a material and tangible architecture. It is in the relationship between the citizen expert and the expert citizen that Clint Abram argues architecture is restorative in a marginalized context. Because not only does it have relevance and meaning, it is a result of intergenerational narratives and knowledge systems about that place and the place-making processes in it. In relinquishing control of the conceptualization of the architecture to processes and frameworks that are embedded in societal concerns, all three examples situate architecture across different modalities, different temporalities and different histories. The first example, the Constitutional Court is very much about the idea that conceptualization and realization of architecture itself can provide the place for healing and symbolize in terms of the future, the future direction of a nation constructing a narrative to legitimate itself as a democratic, political, legal entity. The architecture of the Constitutional Court, in order to situate itself within a collective history in a broad, geo, in a broad geopolitical, economic, social, cultural, colonial, and post-colonial environment, takes a backseat and biases active participatory social engagement to capture a significant moment in time, the birth of a democratic republic. 
In Vukuzaka, there is an appreciation of this in the South African context. There is a necessity to think through how the process and the logics of procurement in which the delivery of architecture functions. This example shows how the need to adapt to the realities in which architects find themselves realigns and redefines architectural practices, architectural practice in stimid and problematic processes. And it is important, therefore, in this instant to see how to remain relevant and contribute. There is a requirement for a reiterative abstraction of the architecture in relation to its reality. Vukuzaki also significantly heightens the tension be between what is seen to be formal and that which is said to be informal. That which is seen to be formal and that which is said to be informal. The tendency to differentiate between the formal city and the informal city in the South African urban context presents an opportunity for architects to extend the practice of architecture as a bridge across this binary. This type of bridging can be seen in Clint Abrams project in Makassar. In Makassar, the engagement with local knowledge system and understanding of locally available materials and technologies makes for the creation of a place that is deeply implicated in the social spatial environment in which it exists. In conclusion, in the global south, architecture and its, its critique must acknowledge and respond to the possibilities that are encompassed in the nature of an urban, an emergent urban landscape through a process that fosters intersections between the individualized objectives of the architecture and the knowledge systems and concerns in the place in which it finds itself. For if as architects were to remain relevant, there needs to be a pivotal shift towards relinquishing control of the conceptualization of the architectural design process to knowledge systems and concerns that are place specific and refocus our expertise on the realization of the same in the realities of our context. It is as though this active engagement with and in our community it is through this active engagement with and in our community that the resultant architecture can be seen to be and experienced as being meaningful and inclusionary of all of us that live in it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Philippa. Extraordinary uh, precision in time. <laughs> so what what a journey you 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 took us to uh, completely in such a brief moment to a completely uh, different environment and um, and engage us into uh, 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 these circumstances that are so so specific in some way of South Africa. Uh, would you uh, stop sharing the the, the Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, so specific of South Africa, and at the same time, with with so many common uh, aspects that we share in or in in Latin America. So uh, it has been enlightening to to learn from these three experiences. That I, I would say that it takes us from from the building as the object of criticism to the process as the object of uh, analysis and uh, and uh, and in 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 these different cases but um, um I, I don't know how to 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 see the, the if there are questions uh, or, or people raising their hands so um, I can help with that if you like yes uh, I can look at the chat or help with Identifying who has a hand up. Fernando, uh, if yeah. you go to gallery view, then you will see uh, the the hands raised in the left uh, top left hand corner of the gallery view, and Joao has uh, uh, raised his hand. Well, uh, please, Joao. Um, thank you, Philippa, for the beautiful lecture. Really, really beautiful. And I would like to know more about the um, how how do you see how this all this discussion and clearly uh, I see there's a connection with the political situation in the country right now. Uh, we know that uh, South Africa is going through a very interesting democratization process, and with social democratic governments. I would like to see how do you see that, and how is this feeling of optimism that is going on in the country. Um, 
well, I, I don't think it's very optimistic currently, but but I think you do touch on something um, that I'm, I'm I was that that basically is shown in all three projects. So so the to answer your question, the short answer is there's not a lot of optimism right now. That came with 1994 where the constitutional court, we love the building, we love the country, and it's not so, it's not so rainbowy anymore. But the, 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 the things that I'm trying to unearth in these different projects is that within this context, at least, projects that do where the, the architect or the, or the architecture takes a step back, and embeds itself within those processes and different communities, those architectures tend to last long. And in this African context, when I say last long, I mean that literally. You know, that, that piece of architecture is not going to get vandalized, it's not going to get burnt down, it's not going to get, it, it, becomes, it becomes a lot more symbolic within the community. I'll give an example in the recent heightened tensions, I'm sure you all saw it on television with the, the burning of things across Durban and in parts of Johannesburg. Um, I'm not a big fan of shopping centers, but what is very interesting is that some of the shopping centers in various marginalized communities, you had people creating human um, chains around these buildings, because for them, that building means something. So whether you like the shopping center typology or you don't, you have to acknowledge the significance of that architecture within its community. And in South Africa, if that isn't really embodied in a, in a a, a project, particularly in marginalized communities, it literally doesn't last very long. And I mean that quite literally, not figuratively. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, it does. Really interesting, really interesting. Thank you. I'm, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Lynette has raised her hand. Um, so thank you. I, I think you've gotten lots of excellent and positive responses. Um, one of the one of the facts on the ground, at least in in the United States, is that a a, a, a fraction of a percentage of buildings realized, and an even smaller fraction of a percentage of infrastructure planned and realized goes through any kind of design process, really. It'll go through a public safety process. I'm curious, given the vast demand for infrastructure and for building in, uh, in South Africa, for example, where you see the um, potential for any kind of larger applicability of these kinds of process, or are they destined to you know, benefit a smaller number? Um, is there a sort of an economy of scales that's part of this? Um, yes, there is. Uh, thank you for the question. That's, I'm, I'm now thinking about it because I hadn't thought about it from that angle, but within all public buildings, at least within the public sector, you have to run what they call public participation. And you are right, sometimes it's very superficial and it's not really meaningful, which means we end up with a whole lot of infrastructure which communities don't want or is not very useful. But I do think that within the rush of trying to get development and within the rush of infrastructure development, I mean, it's kind of the reason where we are now. It's, it's our need and the rush to deliver these projects. And at some, time, at some point we have to pause and look at what are we really creating. So if we look at the project in Makassar, yes, it did run over two years, but Clint went to Makassar initially not to build a building. He went there to work with the youth in the community. And out of that developed an architecture and out of that architecture, if you go to Makassar now, the typology is being replicated within that community. There's larger scales building, uh, uh, buildings going up. So in that case, Clint has managed to bring some expertise in the realization of an architecture. And I think it's important that we move away from growth and progress for the sake of growth and progress that hasn't gotten us very far and step back and start thinking critically as to what are these buildings doing for our societies? Are they actually benefiting them or even marginalizing them further? And in some of the cases, they marginalize them even further. So we are moving from the the center of the argument is moving from the architect uh, to, to his relation to, to the community. So he becomes not just an artist, but 
a listener, something that will uh, 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 enhance a process of integrating what he has to give with what is already there. Yes, yes, in, in, in essence, that, that's kind of what it is, but I think it even moves just, it's, it's beyond the architect. It's the architect, it's the client, it's the developer, it's the people who are delivering the infrastructure. So whether it's a private endeavor or a public endeavor, I'll go back to the example of um, community members who formed human chains around pieces of infrastructure within their communities that they found significant. For me, that was a, an incredibly poignant moment in our history as in, in, in the built environment history post 1994, because the significance of what we do as architects was quite clear. We can create long lasting symbolic interventions within communities that are meaningful and people can relate to. And if you put a bit more effort be, into that, it can actually start to do something else. I think so, yeah, not just the architect, I would argue and say, even private developers, governments, municipalities. Uh, Alexandra Stoll has a question, I think. Yes, first of all, thank you. That was a really, really thought inspiring and wonderful talk. Um, and we're worlds apart. I'm, I'm sitting in the East Coast of the US and um, that's literally thousands of miles away from, from where you are sitting. But there are some, I see some parallels to our situation here. And one of them is the question of um, top down versus bottom up. So the top down planning, um, which is so prevalent. And I think Lynette um, also, also uh, touched on that. Um, versus what you're showing as really the architects listening to the community and involving the stakeholders and through that gaining community buy-in. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, one of the things that we found in the US is that we often come up against policy decisions that are sometimes decades old that really determine what we are able to do. Um, part of it is outdated laws or laws that are on the book. And of course, once you build something, it tends to stay around for decades. So I'm just wondering if in, in your context, if you feel that the architects that have worked in the manner um, that you were describing, uh, really trying to engage the community and also get community buy-in, if you if you feel that that has um, helped to change the culture of both what the community expects and also what the policymakers are willing to concede. Um, th there is a slight shift. So I'll talk to Vukazaka that was done by Richard Stretton from Coop Design. He's a little bit of a, a maverick activist. And that proposition was actually made to the municipality unsolicited and it, it, they, there was uptake. So, so the architects with the built environment professionals are starting to push around some of these policies, but you're absolutely right that a lot of these processes require patience and they, re they require a certain level of time, which is, which is why I said, you know, we've got to stop and take stock of what you're doing. But there's even more examples where if with a little bit of time, because the reality is even people who create the policy or enforce the regulations, it's not that they're completely closed off to change, it's just that they haven't been given a, a, another alternative of how to do this. And sometimes it's about putting the work in and having a, a, a discussion and going through that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't really work. So if you look at the building in Makassa, there was this very strange rule in Makassa that around corners, you couldn't build close to it, but that's the site the community were working with. And, that also involved a level of negotiation with the city of Cape Town. And, and now they, you know, they really enjoy the space and they have events there as well. So it's about negotiating, but I, I, I can see that, that, I mean, you'd also deal with that. And it, it is very much here. We have a very top down structure, but more and more, and COVID's done very many terrible things. But I think the one thing it has done is allowed for us to pause a little bit, to pause and just try and rethink how we're approaching the built environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I think Anna has a question. Yes, uh, Fernando, thank you. Uh, Felipa, um, it was really beautiful, your lecture. I think we are almost touched and moved. And uh, this is perhaps not, yes, I have a question, but it's perhaps more uh, a comment uh, because your, your, your talk remind me 
um, the 60s, during the 60s, the participation process uh, in um, Latin America, of course, Previ came up to my mind, uh, all this community involvement and, and very special policy makers. Uh, and of course, I thought as well um, on the incredible Hassan Fatih and um, that finally the, the book, I, I always prefer the, the French title, which is Building uh, with the People, Construire avec le Peuple, the, 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 the American translation, it's Architecture for the Poor, it's a different thing, the title. But this is just a comment that uh, how important and, and, and stimulating is the your Macassar project. Um, and I really do believe that it's possible to add um, experiences to experience and perhaps architectural criticism could uh, focus in these matters at, as it happens uh, during the late 60s and beginning of the 70s. Even in my, my country, we had in, in, in Portugal, we had a, a kind of um, interesting approach uh, after the democratic revolution, of course, for two years, and then it, is, it was over, you know, the system. Pff, and catch the thing. But so these are some comments just to, 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 to say how it was really enlightening your, your talk. And, and, and the question, if it is a question, is um, how um, could you please develop on the, 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 the connections, the links you made with the school, with the university, and all these German universities I, I heard about Dusseldorf, Aachen, uh, because this is very important to, to the proud of the, the people to have coming abroad students with, with their generation generosity uh, to, to discuss. Could you please explain a little bit these connections? And, and I will shut up, but I would love to, to stay all evening talking with you. So now mm -hmm. I... Uh, thank you very much for those kind comments, Anna. Uh, yeah, and I, I do think we can definitely take this offline and have a bit more chat. I'd also like to hear about what happened that side. So in, in terms of the connection with the two German there's actually three German universities and the, 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 techni the, the vocation or tec the Technicon in Cape Town. What had happened before is that both RWTH and uh, the Paul, Roger, Paul Barron's um, art school, I'll remember the other one, um, had done various projects in different parts of Cape Town, but it had never really picked up traction. You, know? you, you come in for two, three months, you're an exchange student, you do a project, you leave, no one takes care of the project, and then you come back. Like I said, in South Africa, architecture doesn't mean very much. It literally doesn't last very long. So when Clint started to work in Makassa, he was approached by them to say, you know, would he want to collaborate? Because I think they were trying to find, I don't want to say formula, because that sounds a bit dry, but I'll say it anyway, to find a way into the community, a, like a, 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 re a real way into the community. And that's kind of how the collaboration um, started. And then with the, with the Cape uh, Peninsula uh, Technological University is that um, just like me, Clint has a very big interest in construction and structures and materiality and the science behind that and the Technicon tends to focus on that. And there's a couple of colleagues there that he'd been working with um, when he was a practicing architect, and that's how they came on board. But I have to say that for me, the most interesting thing was to see students within very different contexts, within very different universities, working together, but more importantly, learning from the people in the community. It was, I mean, that building went up quite quickly. I think in about three weeks, they had that thing going. There was a, there was a lot of energy that went there. It's a 45 minute drive. You know, my students are usually at least half an hour late for every lecture, but they were never late to go and um, to, to be on site and to, to work. they would work till six, seven, sometimes nine at night. And it was that, I think, which makes the building very special within the community. OK, well, we are we are I think we are running out of time. So there are some questions, uh, um, more questions, but I think we can hold them for, for 
afterwards. Uh, and, um, and so we don't uh, break uh, that much our schedule. Uh, what do you think, Wilfred? Yeah, I think uh, we have, uh, we are pushing uh, the boundaries of time and uh, I really have to say that we have to uh, move on. So, uh, Filippa, thank you very much for a fantastic and inspiring presentation. There's a lot more to be discussed and uh, I hope we can do that in the final uh, round table. So do uh, stay around, please. Um, and uh, we now take a very, very brief period uh, break of five minutes. So we return at 17 minutes past, please. And uh, Blaget, uh, if we can test your screen share function uh, during the break, please. Of course, of course we can, yes. But uh, one, one question I have, uh, how do you pronounce your name? Is it? Uh, it's Boisier. Boisier, yeah, so no, I- Perfect. Uh, <laughs> Boisier, it's, it's a B-V-A, right? So, uh, in fact, yes, yeah. it should be okay. like this. Thank okay. you, so. So uh, let me, let me try to share my screen maybe. Mm, one moment. Wonderful. Uh, it seems it's okay. it's okay. Yes. Can you go okay. to full screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Thank we'll you. return at 17 minutes past, uh, please, everyone. Okay.
Well, as faces begin to appear, <laughs> we should be, we, should we begin? Um, I, 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 we should see some more faces. No, please start, uh, Fernando. Okay, okay. Well, um, I, I'm going to present um, our, um, uh, Lynette Wither. She has a Master of Architecture from Columbia University, uh, which she got in 1990, and a um, doctorate at the ETH Zurich. Um, uh, and she is an Associate Professor of Practice in the Masters of S Sustainability Management uh, program at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. And she is a principal investigator on two year project funded by the United Nations Development Program in Guinea and the Earth Institute to support community based environmental practice impact assessment from bauxite mining. She is a former associate professor and head of the Department of Architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design. She has also taught at the ETH Zurich, Cornell University, City College of New York, and Cranbrook Academy. She is the author of From, From Year Zero to Economic Miracle, West German Architecture 1949-63, forthcoming from GTA Verlag in next spring 2022. So Lynette, you are welcome. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen so you guys have my slides. All good with a slide share? You have to enlarge. Okay, that's perfect. perfect. Fabulous. <clears throat> so I'll just start briefly by thanking the organizers, Wilfred, for uh, masterminding this and for reconnecting me with Robert McCarter, who I've known since I was an undergraduate at Columbia in 1983, and Sandra Staub, who I met in Berlin in 1985. So this is also something of a reunion. Um, so I will start. On May 10th, 1949, Bonn was ratified as the provisional capital of West Germany. The parliament would meet in an addition to a Weimar period college, a building that had no relevance at all to Germany's political history. It was a fresh start. Hans Schwippert had been commissioned to draw the initial plans. He stayed on as architect. Schwippert began work in 1948. Over the early works, weeks of 1949, he produced numerous sketches of which this is one of the earliest. Thereafter, his office moved quickly to finalize design. The plenary groundbreaking was in April of that year. The hall was inaugurated to great fanfare in, on September 9th. Everything occurred at breakneck speed. The pressure to design, detail, source, schedule, and oversee construction of the building within this 10-month period is hard to imagine, especially because this was its context, Bonn in the late 1940s. No less dire than material privation was travail about architecture's ethical dimensions. With cities decimated, the occupying forces reinstated politically compromised urban planners and architects to government positions, transition from Albert Speer's staff to an important role in reconstruction was swift. As Friedrich Thames, a member of Speer's internal staff concluded, quote, the comfortable simplification, modern democratic, traditional national socialist has lost its credibility. Theoretical discourse crosses political boundaries, end quote. Modernism had lost its ethical aura. It needed new rules. Baukunst und Werkform, the journal of the revived German Werkbund was quick to respond. A 1947 statement in its first issue made clear continuity was impossible, but a total break with the past would be unsupportable. 
They wrote, the collapse destroyed the visible world of our lives and work. We thought then that we would return to action. Today, two years later, we recognize the degree to which the visible collapse is only an expression of spiritual erosion. We are left to return to the foundation of things. In 1951, three and a half years later and less than two years after the Bundeshaus inauguration, Schwippert, seen here on the left, gesturing at the model with Theodor Heuss, who was the Bundes president, and his Werkbund colleagues set out to take stock of architecture status at the second of the Darmstädter Gespräche, a series of annual conferences sponsored by the city of Darmstadt. The topic, Mensch und Raum, human being in space, represented precisely that, quote, return to the foundation. It was an occasion to imagine architecture's purpose, to reconceive fraught modernist ideas, many of which had been co-authored by the organizers of the conference when they were still young avant-gardists. Schrippert's Bundeshaus is remarkable as a laboratory for these theoretical urges. It is no less remarkable for the architectural sleight of hand that allowed Schwippert to realize a building that has, through its history, been received as, quote unquote, uh, transparent. Although the materials of modern architecture, glass, steel, concrete, were scarce at the time of its construction. Even more interestingly, it begs the question of whether, despite Tam's pointed diagnosis, transparency might somehow magically affirm democracy by allowing the public to see what was going on. Theory and material are inextricable in the Bundeshaus. Religion in the early German Federal Republic was woven through the social fabric. In 1946, 96% of Germans identified as Christian. The Allied occupying forces partnered with religious institutions to effect rebuilding. Quote, democracy lives from Christianity and it alone protects law and liberty, end quote, as Protestant pastor Martin Niemöller wrote in 1945. Churches offered architects a much desired opportunity to develop a new spatial build vision for German society. As Ulrich Konrads, the assistant editor of Baukunst und Werkform explained, quote, the existential had precedent no one wanted to live in cellars. Therefore, spatial building was only possible in church building, end quote. Schwippert's Bundeshaus bears out this confluence of organized religion, architectural design, and statecraft. Schwippert first designed the plenary in this series of sketches from 1948. The first two sketches presumed a traditional hierarchy. They're the ones on the top of this drawing presumed a traditional hierarchy of delegate and leadership. The versions that followed seemed to search for parity between audience and speaker, while the location of light, backlit, sidelit, toplit is modulated. More was at stake than transparency in view. Transmission of light and the transcendence that it signified was just as important. And ultimately, the gridded zenithal surface he sketched became the custom light ceiling he designed with a manufacturer, Ostrom. Trippert's studies acknowledge his mentor, collaborator, and dear friend, Rudolf Schwartz. Schwartz, like Schwippert and Adenauer, a Rhineland Catholic, had interrupted his architectural education to study theology. In 1947, he issued a book called Vom Bau der Kirche on the building of the church in which he proposed a series of liturgical spatial diagrams. The quote unquote ring number one or open ring number two here, centered and circular, bore the imprint of a congregation created by joining hands. A frontal organization, a path, number four, registered in its array the forward looking vision of pilgrimage. A culminating typology, the Cathedral of All Eras, number seven, included centering and passage, leading to a moment he called the Heiliges All, or all encompassing holy space. Given his close relationship to Schwartz, Schwippert's plenary studies can be seen as more than organizational schemes. They are closely associated with transcendental spiritual space. 
light embodied both the light of the world and the light of God. Schrippert's design sketches ponder the way geometry constructs the relationship of the building's occupants to one another and the importance of that relationship of a to that relationship of a transcendental space that light intimates. Schrippert produced numerous sketches in early 1949. I'm going to show you a few of them. Each beautifully renders volume and landscape, but also depicts glazing precisely as a gridded surface. Glass was essential to Schrippert's ambition that this be, quote, the lightest parliament in the world. Still, few architecture historical accounts of the building acknowledge how little of it is actually glass. Schrippert sketched a surface grid to articulate facades even where there is no glass. The grid unifies the rangy complex, but it also implies glazing and its transparency where there is none. A photo of the administrative wing as realized shows how Schwippert's optical illusion worked. Conventional windows were set within darker stone crossed by a lighter superordinate grid. The low relief conjoined the inset windows with the spandrels below so that one might easily mistake this plane for the typical glass inset in a glazed office building. The sleight of hand Schrippert employed here emerges in all his details. Consider this, the glazed side walls of the plenary. On the exterior, which is what you're seeing now, the windows lay flat against a surface grid, but on the interior, they're angled within its depth. In actuality, the steel grid is part of the bearing structure of the building. Conflating these elements, structure and glazing, make the glazing appear as a single integral surface. But the plenary wall and the adjacent restaurant are really the only large glazed areas in the building. The suggestive power of surface relief coupled with the building's spatial configuration created the impression of transparency. The interior spatial sequence calibrates daylighting, dimension, view, color, and texture, asymmetry, and orienting movement. Transparency, the view through, the view out, the view in, the view across, is limited throughout the entrance. Once inside the building though, and able to move into the plenary, through the restaurant, onto the open terrace, the visitor experiences space as expansive. The entry to the building is hardly documented in any photographs or publications. This shot, comes from a galley in the Schwippert archive of an unrealized publication. Upon entry, the visitor stood in an elongated space um, that ended in a solid wall. And this is what's marked for Halle uh, on this, on the right-hand side of the sketch. Um, neither entry hall nor the adjacent space provided any view out. The sparse daylight came only from the entry doors. Two sets of glass doors at the end of the entry hall provided a sense of what was to come. On the left, the doors opened onto the restaurant. Expansive, flooded with natural light, the restaurant was a dramatic contrast to the entrance. On the right was the foyer. Two stories high with windows facing the street. The main entrance to the plenary hall sat asymmetrically in the opposite wall. Only upon entering the plenary was a visitor repositioned on access. Access, excuse me. Every other element of the sequence was organized on the oblique. Even in the symmetrical plenary, however, the glass walls facing east and west always produced asymmetrical light conditions, the conditions Schwippert had studied in his sketches. As an early attempt to return to the foundation of things, the Bundeshaus provided much from which to extrapolate. Schrippert, again, took up its central probe, that of transparency, at the 1951 Darmstädter Gespräch. This is actually a cover of a catalog that was issued for a later exhibition associated with it that ran in Berlin, not in Darmstadt. Monitoring an open forum discussion at the end of the second day, Schwippert questioned absolute reciprocity between an era's spiritual impulse and the spaces it inhabits. He proposed a neologism, wohnwollen, the will to dwell or inhabit. Wohnwollen was transcendent, affirming, and ethical, but it couldn't exist without a physical space to occupy. 
Subverting typical modernist polemic, Schwippert suggested that Wohnwollen might exist independent of an era's physical reality. Quote, what does the directive of building look like for us today? In a time characterized by unrest, fear, and threat, we sense around the world a directive for anything but a bastion of refuge. We have to ask, is the affinity between the brightness and lightness of our spatial desire and the technical means of contemporary building, is this affinity between these two things the only possibility? If we had neither steel nor glass, would then spatial building be forever eliminated? In other words, is that spatial building, which most precisely bespeaks our dwelling today, tied to the materials of today, or is this von von so strong that it can form all simple materials, even older forms of construction, end quote. To decouple material progress from spatial expansion to counter a long-held modernist canon was a radical act. Perhaps pragmatism spoke here. The Bundeshaus was seen as transparent in spite of material scarcity. But Schwippert also imagined a more sinister scenario, quote, that someone might misuse the means of today to make spaces that bear no relation to us, end quote. The experience of the Third Reich had proven modern architecture was no guarantee of democratic politics. If von Wollen depended upon modern materials, then their lack or misuse might mean, quote, an end to spatial building. If spatial building was the fundamental activity through which community was formed, what would its end mean? And if spatial building were merely material dependent or perhaps worse, corruptible by materials misused, then there was little hope for architectural ethics. I'm showing you this page because the visitor to this exhibition um, augmented it with his own sketches of churches by Otto Bartning and Rudolf Schwartz. So I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Uh, Schwippert offered three distinct scenarios that corresponding spatial desire and technical means was quote, the only possibility to build concretely in accordance with the internal directive. Another possibility, spatial desire could be quote, so strong that it can form all simple materials, even all older forms of construction. Or lastly, that someone might, quote, misuse the means of today to make spaces that bear no relationship to us, end quote. As architect of the Bundeshaus, he had made clear, architecture was the practice of sensing and embodying von Wollen under any material circumstances. Given Tom's comfortable simplification though, why insist on an architecture of light and transparency of glass and steel at all? The motto, das bunte Glas zerstörten Hass, bright glass uh, destroys hate, was engraved on Bruno Todd's 1914 glass pavilion. It was an, a utopian credo proclaimed on the threshold of an unimaginably violent historical moment. Writing 40 years later, about West Germany's first World's Fair pavilion, Schwippert, oops, um, sorry, the slide wouldn't change. There you go. Um, writing 40 years later about West Germany's first World's Fair pavilion, Schwippert imagined instead an emergent life world, one in which light and lightness had already subtly affected change. Quote, the glass walls, the new brightness of the office, the workshop, the factory, the delicate lines of the new furnishings, the friendliness of living amidst greenery. These together are the great efforts of human resistance to threat, to darkness, to looming chaos, end quote. Glass no longer embodied the messianic promise it had in 1914. Lightness, a demand that came from the bottom up from the people in their bright offices was democratic in the most basic sense. The architecture of the Bundeshaus was, in this context, the manifestation of a groundswell, not a mere symbol of good governance or a means of ensuring it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's so, so, so suggesting is the title that the lightest parliament, it, it looks like a program. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible how it relates to the previous presentation by Philippa because 
it's a, it's a moment, as you said, of unrest, fear, and threat. And, and, and then I, I was thinking that the, this project was all about uh, gather, uh, reaching the cir circumstance, reaching the moment, reaching the, the feelings of the people and trying to, to, to put them into uh, the proper architecture for that moment. But at the same time, uh, all this effort of, for the architect of learning, of listening to, the, to what is happening in the community, in, in, in the country, uh, in the end, he's alone to decide. In, he, in the end, he's alone with his designs. I, 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 what do you think about it? Um, so I think Schwippert is a really fascinating figure for a lot of reasons. I mean, the, the, the 1950s is not really a moment of participatory design in the same way. There were the so-called Thoma Frauen, the, the brigades of people who would go out and harvest broken bricks and stones, et cetera, in order to affect rebuilding. So there was a kind of a, a tradition of the anonymous building, et cetera. Um, the reason that I say Schwippert is kind of remarkable is that unlike other architects of the period, there is amazing documentation of everyone who worked in his office, including women who worked in his office, who contributed to the project. The person he hired to document the construction of this building was an autodidact female photographer who had her own small architecture studio. And if you look at the way his working drawings are done and the working drawings of the Bundeshaus are lost, but I was able to look at working drawings for another project of his in Berlin, they're drawn in a way that allows for a huge amount of discretion in building because he gives essentially regulating lines, he gives alignments, he gives a sort of geometric sense of what's desired, but entrusts basic decisions to the people doing the work. So I, I'm not sure that, you know, Schwippert didn't do a listening tour through Germany like a CEO might do now to understand what people desired. He was making a diagnosis and saying living amongst rubble and on the one hand, and coming to terms with the legacy of the Third Reich, we, we, it's a very narrow pathway between these two straits. But at the same time, the way he enacted his design decisions were participatory in a way that's quite unusual for the era. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing hands raised, but uh, there are a lot of comments in the chat um, um, well, actually, uh, William has raised his hand, and then I would like to say something. Okay, but go William. ahead. You have to unmute. Uh, you you have to unmute your microphone, William. Is it okay now? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I haven't mastered this yellow hand. Uh, there is uh, the reaction, uh, there is a line at the bottom and you can go to reaction and then there's a choice. Oh, excuse me, all right. Anyway, um, I, I wish to say I appreciated this uh, presentation very much indeed for several um, uh, reasons. Um, <clears throat> it's partly because it uh, probes the thought process in the sense of uh, rationale, but way beyond that, intuition, the search for deeper symbols, and then the staging of that and their translation into arrangement form and material, with a very interesting speculation that someone introduced in a text as to whether or not that is a complete uh, process or whether some other material might have done the, the job. But as a sort of unraveling of the, what I would call the anatomy of intentions, um, I found this a very uh, convincing uh, talk. And uh, I had the chance, since I couldn't uh, be involved last weekend, to look at several of the uh, presentations and We are losing you. William, William, you have to repeat. Um, um, you have to 
uh, refresh your Zoom um, uh, sacred uh, in in the search for a refounding of a, a nation after the disaster of fascism. And of course, a lot of the meaning of these materials. Sorry, yeah. we lost the last part. You you should repeat it, please. Uh, am I he hearing yeah. me now? Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, the the inter intermingling of the sacred and the secular, the mythical dimension, um, as a refounding of the nation to try and leap over the horror of, of, of fascism, uh, and in which, as Gombrich was always saying in terms of ping and pong, a lot of the meaning of the transparency, the lightness and so on, derives from the contrast quite clearly with the, the earlier uh, regime. But what I, the point I was making is one about approach because um, Caroline Vogt's presentation uh, last week has some parallels uh, to this. Now, I find this perfectly uh, related to the whole problem of evaluation, because uh, even though that was not the principal aim of Lynette's talk, um, I believe that one of the modes of criticism which, which uh, is balanced, and yesterday I was talking about polemic, about attack, or, is precisely that, is the unraveling, uh, the experience of a building, the analysis of it, the gradual uh, explosion of it to get to the heart of what I call the anatomy of intentions, uh, and then even to look at conflicts which emerge and come back again to a, a judgment or an assessment, placing that building eventually, whichever building it is, in the context of the architectural culture of the time and possibly in the longer term of history as an evaluation. So I found this a really inspiring um, and very precise talk. So thank you very much, Lynette. So, Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I will say this is a building that no longer exists as it had. It was a kind of victim to a light 1980s impulse to build a larger parliament, after which an even larger parliament became politically and historically necessary as the nation was reunified. I do want to point, though, um, one thing that has been uh, really of great interest to me around this question of architectural criticism is at what point is it an internal search for understanding what's going on? One of the things that I've always found so fascinating about the 1951 Darmstädter Gespräch is it's looking, it's, 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 they, you know, they invited Martin Heidegger, they invited Jose Ortega Gasset. So they had philosophers in the space but they were looking for sort of things that they found to be foundational and internal to architecture, as opposed to trying to find a philosophical grounding that came from philosophy. What I wanted to add is that the religious dimension of all of this has been very undervalued. And I wanted to shout out Paul Betts' new book on religion and rebuilding uh, in the post-war period as something that has really shifted the way the scholarship could go. Yes, um, interesting the, the relation between church and parliament and, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, there are two hands raised. Well, um, I actually, I, I just wanted to, because I was <laughs> following uh, William, um, this is a tremendous uh, topic and there's a lot more, of course, that you could have said, uh, but uh, because of time, uh, you didn't. And uh, But I know that there is a lot of uh, research that you've done. Um, I just want to point to the continuing controversy around uh, glass as a symbol of uh, democracy in Germany. Of course, it's been reduced to that simple um, symbolic um, significance. Um, and the Darmstädter Gespräche, that's, so that's one thing, and Darmstädter Gespräche uh, in the enormous controversy that was uh, um, uh, caused by the confrontation between Sharon on the one hand and Bonatz on the other hand, um, shows how the, the kind of fundamentalist position was alive in Germany at the time. And so Schrippert's position uh, was in, in a very delicate moment, uh, kind of a, of course, a, a politically uh, desired uh, architecture. And I think that the kind of criticism that was going on, the architectural criticism or the philosophical criticism that was going on uh, outlasted uh, the, the construction period and, um, 
you know, the, the conservatives have been licking their wounds uh, ever since. So, um, you know, not until the reconstruction of the palace in Berlin uh, has there been a kind of a, a victory of the conservatives. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the point is, uh, under the notion of architectural criticism, uh, Schwippert was working out on his own uh, in, in parallel with, uh, as you have said, with the other thoughts uh, uh, proposed by Rudolf Schwarz, a kind of internalized architectural criticism of architecture in Germany at the time. I would yes. I agree. Um, Jasna Galhier, um, um, do you want to question? Yes, I would like to. First of all, thank you for this fascinating uh, presentation. And uh, what interests me particularly is if you could somehow compare the, the, this uh, case study with the Hochschule für Gestaltung complex. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, that's practically at the same time and, uh, and sharing the, the uh, wide range of. Uh, common uh, questions that were connected with uh, the democracy in architecture and the Bauhaus tradition too as well. Sure, of course. I mean, there's there's quite a quite a bit of really wonderful scholarship on the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm. Um, the building is actually later than this period. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a mid 50s building and shockingly the landscape changes radically in Germany very, very quickly in part because, uh, and this will sound strange, but in part because of the Korean war, the US needed German steel for that war. And there was a huge revving up of industry around that. Schwippert is also a figure here. He um, is tasked with by the German president, by Theodor Heuss and by the German parliament with creating the liaison between industry and design. And you see companies like Braun or Braun come out of that. And the Werkbund is also in a kind of um, interesting tense relationship with the Hochschule für Gestaltung because of the way it develops. But someone like Dieter Rams, who is central in Ulm, is also a pivotal figure here. I, I don't think that off the top of my head, I can answer your question about the architecture per se, except to say that there is also going on in Germany at this time through the Marshall Plan, a huge amount of uh, uh, many, many American architects of the international style, SOM foremost among them are building in Germany. And with that comes a real change in the idiom of modern architecture. So you move away from this much more filigrane, um, delicate, uh, expressive, light architecture that Schwippert is talking about towards something that is much more robust and more recognizable as a uh, uh, you know as an international and I would I would put um, Rams Dieter Rams design philosophy into that let's say more robust more recognizably late 50s 60s idiom so um, I think it's a great question maybe that's what I write my next essay about and when I do and I have the research to answer your excellent question I would be happy to be in touch. Well, I think, uh, thank you. I think we have uh, no more time. So uh, maybe Alexandra Staub has, wants to make the, the last short question. It, it's a short question, but I think it's going to lead to a longer discussion if I ask it. But um, I, I was just intrigued by um, the uh, combination of the political structures and, and religion. Um, which, of course, you know, the, this was also politically a time when the Christian Democratic Party was positioning and, and basically took over uh, German politics for many years. One thing I haven't heard you mention, and I'm just curious if there is scholarship on it or if you've looked at it, is um, this building in the context of what was happening 
in East Germany and um, because the German Democratic Republic was, you know, it, it hadn't been established yet, but things were clearly shifting into a, diff a different direction in the East. And I'm wondering if some of this relig religious, religious fervor, if you will, within architecture could also be attributed to that shift. I know in politics it was, so I'm wondering if that moved over into architecture as well. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I, I, I can't speak directly to the architecture, but I will give two brief examples. Um, the Otto Bartning built what were called the Notkirchen uh, emergency churches. 45, 50 of them were realized, and they were realized throughout Germany. Mm -hmm. So there was this emergency church building, and they are all still extant. <clears throat> they were loved, cared for, all still extant. The other thing that's quite interesting is to know that I, even under Russian occupation, there was recognition of the fact that the only intact civil society structures left in Germany after the fall of the government and you know, a generation of, of um, NS rule were the churches. And the churches were radically compromised for their collaboration or their lack of, you know, lack of courage, but they were still functional. They and and the Western occupying forces, as well as the Russian occupying forces, used those as a mechanism to distribute food aid, begin rebuilding, set up governmental structures, community structures. So they were seen practically as a delivery system in both sides, which I find fascinating. And again, I would point people to um, Paul Betts, uh, but there are also, um, you know, I, I can also reference a few articles beyond that in those two immediate examples. And that's right after the war. Of course, the Cold War becomes much more contested. It's less so in those early years because there is so much mass migration. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the topic off the, the figure off the top of my head, but something like 35% of Germans living in West Germany had not lived there before the war. Mm -hmm. So there are migrations back and forth, and it's much more fluid initially in this period, let's say up until 1949-50. Thank, Thank you, you Lynette. Thank you. Well, we must move forward. So we are going back to our uh, bank tower. Uh, we already saw one by Kevin Lowe, and so this is, uh, well, Alexandra Straub is going to present um, about the the, uh, the Bank America Tower in New York, and she's a professor of architecture at Penn State University, where she has taught since 2001. In addition to numerous articles and papers on how culture intersects with the built environment, she has published two books. Conflicted Identities, Housing and the Politics of Cultural Representation from 2015, and the Rutledge Companion to Modernity, Space and Gender from 2018. The later and edited volume spanning examples across all the, of the world. She received her architectural education at the University of the Arts in Berlin and the Brandenburg Technical University in Cottbus and worked for many years as a freelance architectural journalist and editor for publications such as Bauwelt, Baumeister and Metropolis. Her current work revolves around ethics and the built environment, including how issues of gender, race, social equity intersect with our design practices and products. So Alexandra, let's see what this tower has to say. Okay, thank you. And Wilfried, if, you know. In 2010, the Bank of America yeah. Tower Building at One Bryant Park in Midtown Manhattan opened to much acclaim as the first LEED Platinum Certified Commercial Skyscraper in history. The developers' aims were lofty, to create the highest quality modern workplace, emphasizing daylight, fresh air, and an intrinsic connection to the outdoors. 
with a slew of advanced technologies to save energy, use less water, generate less construction waste, and provide healthier and more comfortable indoor environments. Just as lofty were the expected investment returns. As the tower became one of the latest gems in an area that had seen spectacular new construction and extensive refurbishment of older buildings sending commercial rents through the roof. In the context of neoliberalism that has shaped the US economy since the 1980s, a focus on making immense financial profits through a philanthropic approach that gives back to the community is not unusual. Yet who ultimately judges the success of these efforts? The Bank of America Tower is an example of architect and developer branding that repeated through the internet has shaped an evaluative narrative that broadly and rapidly molded the building's image. Faced with this so-called critique that fuels the perception of a building's success, how can we begin to form a more nuanced evaluation of the building in question? Starting from the premise that architectural criticism should try, strive for transparency in establishing the criteria by which buildings are assessed, I propose a method of criticism based on an analysis of stakeholder agency and interests as a key to understanding and critiquing a building's ethical merit. This method interlinks three analytical layers, a consideration of stakeholder interests in the design process, an analysis of the building's aesthetic qualities and their reflection of stakeholder interests, and how the building setting and spatial qualities allow power over stakeholders versus their empowerment. The decision to build the Bank of America Tower came about, like many such decisions, through a series of opportunities. The Durst organization had spent decades buying up properties in a somewhat rundown pocket of Manhattan, and in 2003 took the final steps of assembling a site for a major new project. As two owners of existing buildings on the site declined to sell, the state of New York informed the Durst organization that if it were able to find an anchor tenant for their project, it could use eminent domain to have the remaining buildings condemned and torn down even though the buildings were not in a so-called blighted neighborhood. Once the Bank of America signed on as the anchor tenant, the remaining holdouts quickly sold and the Durst organization was able to move forward with the project. The Durst organization regarded the new building as a public relations boost that would highlight the company's perceived leadership and innovation among New York realtors, heralding the tower as a new standard in sustainable commercial construction and the first skyscraper in North America to achieve LEED Platinum certification, the developers touted the 55-story, 2.2 million square foot building as visionary, creating the highest quality modern workplace, emphasizing daylight, fresh air, and an intrinsic connection to the outdoors. The developer highlighted portions of the building that would be available to the public as well including a ground floor urban garden room, a pedestrian passageway, and a restored 500,000 square foot theater on the site. In 2003, the Durst organization approached Richard Cook of Cook and Fox Architects, who saw a need for more sustainable development in urban centers, stating that inefficient, outdated urbanity places an unsustainable demand on our sources of energy. Therefore, it is imperative that we consider not only how much energy we use, but also where it is coming from and how it is made. The architect saw the Bank of America Tower as an opportunity to establish new benchmarks for high performance buildings that would use state-of-the-art technology while incorporating the city's transit infrastructure through access to a major underground transit hub. The features chosen were not technologically new, what was novel was the architect's desire to incorporate so many of them in a single large scale office buildings. While the architect saw the Bank of America project as an opportunity to push global human health and well being, the many claims regarding the building's sustainability were designed to also market the firm as a sustainability innovator. The, the building was frequently touted as the first skyscraper in North America to achieve LEED Platinum certification. As such, the US Green Building Council became an important stakeholder in the design and building process, as it saw the reputation of its LEED system advanced. Certification of such a high profile skyscraper, which is fee based and completely voluntary, showed potential for the US Green Building Council to further its reputation in defining successful sustainable architecture. 
Both the developers and the architects claims of sustainability came under question in 2015, as it became evident that with more than double the energy use per square foot as compared to other office towers, the Bank of America Tower was one of the largest energy consumers in New York City, both when compared to all bank or financial institution buildings, as well as peer buildings, i.e. buildings of a similar age, building type, and size. Outrage came swiftly. The new city data also called into question the definition of sustainability suggested by the building's LEED Platinum rating, which had implied that the building was a model for the future. What had gone wrong? It soon became clear that energy use as a lead and marketing strategy had not realistically considered the building in use. For example, the many computers used on the bank's six trading floors required an enormous amount of energy that no one had accounted for. The architects and developers' claims of energy savings were equally misleading, as they described such savings without defining comparison objects or standards. Once comparable buildings in Manhattan were brought into play through the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, Energy and Water Performance map, the architects and developers' optimistic calculations of vast energy savings evaporated. The Bank of America Towers architects used aesthetics in the form of futuristic design and fragments of nature to signal both market-driven corporate power and ecological values with an emphasis arguably placed on the former. This focus mirrors how LEED's system of evaluating green buildings has evolved into a vehicle for promoting premium real estate. Rick Fredrizzi, one of LEED's founders, has made clear that LEED's green building approach was market-driven from the outset, born of a marriage between the consumer's aesthetic desires and the, building's, the builder's attempts at resource-saving technical functionality. In large part, buildings like the Bank of America Tower do not have a stereotypically green aesthetic. The tower uses largely high-tech means to reduce energy consumption and waste, and many systems are hidden. The developer and architect were interested in producing an iconic looking building that would visually stand out in the New York skyline. The architects theorized about users' interests based on their own experience, conflating fresh air and views with sustainability. The building's aesthetic was further advanced through an emphasis on its quartz crystal faceted facade and the 3,500 square foot urban garden room, a ground floor space that would be open to the public as a type of weather protected lounge. Although not directly adjacent to Bryant Park, the architects emphasized the popular park as a central concept for their design. In their metaphorical use of natural elements and vegetation, the architects merged a conventional expression of corporate power architecture, emphasizing hard tech modernism with a softer focus on the ideals of greenery, fresh air, and ecology. These stood in for the nature that Manhattan's hard urbanity was loath to provide. The interior design of the upper floors was rather conventional, with a clean line aesthetic typical of modernist inspired corporate clients. As in most office towers, natural lighting is limited by opportunities for window placement. While executive offices and conference rooms on the building's perimeter do have access to views and natural daylight, the six trading floors are artificially lit, open plan office spaces with bleak white columns stoically placed between vast rows of office desks, each topped with five monitors and other computer equipment. Overall, the building's aesthetic language vacillates between the status expectations of a high-end corporate client and the assumed user desires of working in nature. Some offices have views of Bryant Park and there is a green space within the building. That such nature-inspired features are limited makes clear the difficulty of including nature within buildings that are set in the complex and dense urban system typified by Midtown Manhattan. In terms of its sustainability, the tower's powerful mechanical features remain aesthetically invisible to the observer, while its fixtures and finishes, highly touted as connecting the user to nature, remain largely metaphorical. The Bank of America Tower was first presented by the architects and developers who had designed and developed it. Their seductive writing about the tower sounded informative and analytic as they theorized about the urban condition, discussed the building's features, and offered up sustainability claims. Yet in a 2009 interview, Douglas Durst also noted that, increased productivity is the big attraction for companies seeking green workspaces. 
For a company with highly paid knowledge workers, even a small increase in productivity yields immense immediate bottom line benefits. Increased productivity is much more important to green building tenants than the much smaller savings from reduced energy and water use. Commenting on the role of the US Green Building Council's lead rating as a marketing mechanism, Durst added, today's marketing forces virtually required that an upgraded office uh, building offer the green benefits guarantee of a lead rating. Would the developers still be willing to build green for the sake of their environment and future generations alone? The question remains unanswered. It is not easy to evaluate a building as complex as the Bank of America Tower. <clears throat> While aspects of the building, such as its energy saving features can be evaluated individually, once the architect advances claims of a more holistic synergistic nature, the building must be seen as more than the sum of its parts. In the Bank of America Tower, the user experience became especially speculative. Was the urban garden room with its sculptural ivy blobs a unique continuation of Bryant Park or simply another high rise lobby space? What about the functional requirements of the Bank of America with its six floors of trading areas dominated by small workspaces stacked with monitors? Not only did these areas require large amounts of energy to run the equipment, they hardly offered their users access to nature. One could even ask if designing a single biophilic building within the dense urbanity of Midtown Manhattan can achieve the type of holistic experience of nature the architects aimed for, or if we would be better off rethinking our urban experience at the scale of the city itself. The Bank of America Tower has many handsome architectural features that architectural critics readily picked up on. <laughs> the lobby is elegantly proportioned, the materiality is modern and understated with an agreeable blend of colors and textures, and spaces along the building's perimeter are well lit. Many of the sustainability features are excellent concepts. Yet in critiquing a building of this nature, is it enough to speak of spatial material and lighting qualities or to list technical features? Especially when both the developer and the architect make claims that they have redefined a building typology, the critic would be well served to closely examine such assertions. In the interest of transparency, architectural critique should help us unravel a building's intertwined narratives in order to build up a more holistic picture of its architectural merits. One way of achieving this is to consider the interests of all stakeholders involved, not just a vocal few. Examining the building's process, aesthetics, and spatial language through the lens of the stakeholders involved brings us closer towards a fair and independent critique. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, it's, um, I, I was thinking uh, about uh, uh, one of the uh, of these uh, assumptions that is uh, so fa false about LEED's uh, certification process with this, if you put some kind of carpet, you are given points. But if you don't use carpet, you are not given any points. So it's, it's nonsense. And on the other hand, on the other hand, I, I don't know if, if the, the height of the building can be presented as a sustainable uh, uh, aspect because it, 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 what is the necessity of making such a high building? Only the, uh, the representation of the institutional power of the owner? Uh, what do you think about it? Um, that, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? The height of the building? I, sorry, I missed that. How does the, the height of the building, if it enters in some way in the critical argument? I, I, I don't know um, what you mean by that specifically. The, I, I think the architects and the developers made a point, they were commissioned with making a, a or the, the developer desired and the architect was commissioned with making a high rise that's um, for an office tower in Manhattan that's that's what you do because the space is so expensive you try to go as high as you can. Um, I think they were trying to redefine the high rise moving forward trying to develop something like the high rise of the future that would be um, both sustainable according to LEED standards, but also offer the P 
people working in that building space, as well as the public who interacted with the building, a new definition of, um, let's say, biophilic design, um, living in nature in, in the large city. So I think that was the, the thing that they attempted. One of the points that I was trying to make here, though, is that the that these claims were very much driven by the people that had a great interest in having the building seen a certain way. So um, the Green Building Council, the developer, the architect, they all had a vision of the building. And that's the narrative that really came out initially about that building. Um, that's the narrative that was also picked up on the internet. Um, I don't, if you read the full article, then you have all the sources that I used, many of them, um, are not so much architectural journals, but they're interviews. They're, they're, it, it's basically the internet blogosphere that takes off um, discussing this building in this way. And very uncritically often because the architect and the developer in their statement sounded so convincing from the outset. Okay. Well, we are, we are we're late again. in our work. So uh, I, I, I will suggest uh, 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 Elias, make a, a, a question, and then um, uh, Robert Carter ma makes his, and, uh, and and then we we get the the, the whole answers uh, all together. Okay, thank you, Alexandra, for uh, this speech. Maybe my question is already answered by Ulf Mager, who says that lead certifications are not based on post-occupancy evaluation. So my, my question was, has the LEED Platinum certification been retracted? Can it be retracted? And furthermore, has this fact backfired in any way? Do critics talk about in a different way now? Uh, is there a different kind of aesthetic promoted by other designers? Or is the corporate and pleasant, as you said, in the end aesthetic, totally divorced now from sustainability. So they're two different things. So there are three questions <laughs> in one. Thank you. Yeah, so the Green, um, one of the speakers for the Green Building Council, I don't know if it was exactly the CEO, I have to, um, I have to go back and, and see what the role was, but one of the, one of the major speakers of the Green Building Council came out vehemently um, against the critiques of the green building of the lead rating um, system, because yeah, there, especially in the popular press, there was a lot of critique about the green, um, about the lead rating system based on this experience and um, calling into question, you can, you can game the lead rating system. You can, if you do certain things, then you get points. So this point system, a lot of architects end up trying to game that system and trying to get the points. Um, there's there's always the question of you know should it be an independent organization that's fee based that awards these the status for certain buildings or should these requirements just be put into the building code and in a country like the U.S. that kind of regulation regulatory approach is difficult to um, is difficult to put into play so we have independent organizations that are virtually market driven, um, if, you, if you look at it, that are providing this certification rather than just having it written into the building code and having, the, um, having there be a non-market based um, approach to, to designating what should be done for sustainability, for ecological sustainability. Does that answer the question? And sorry, yeah, the other- yeah. yeah, I was just saying whether one would see different trends regarding aesthetics already of the skyscrapers, because in the beginning you put the two together. Right. Sustainability and aesthetics as a, as a corporate package. Yes, please, Robert. Uh, 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 and then Lee asks for a question. Yes, I just uh, thank you for a very uh, stimulating presentation. And um, uh, it's very good to be participating in a takedown of L E E D. Um, yeah. the, the, the fact is that this system is set up as a formula, uh, which is perfect for corporate uh, developers. They just need a formula to have the fig leaf to cover themselves. Has absolutely nothing, as you showed, uh, often to do with the, the true sustainability of the building. 
Um, some time ago, I was working on a building and I discovered that if I were to save an existing building fabric, I would actually get less credit in that particular moment uh, in the definition of lead than if I put a bicycle rack in front of the new building. Um, so the embodied energy had absolutely no, uh, no, no uh, weight in the formula. But I, I would have to say, and maybe this is for the final discussion at the end of the session, I'm, I'm also intrigued by uh, the other, the, the sort of other aspect of your of your title, whose architecture, whose criticism. I think that you know we we do have to get past lead, and we have to really think about how uh, we as critics evaluate buildings. And there's way too much emphasis on these kind of fast answers, like oh, it's a lead platinum building. And people even introduce that as they introduce the project to students at school, which I find very problematic because uh, it's as if it sort of has a, it comes in with an imprimatur already, you know, um, of some kind of um, goodness and grace, which <laughs> at least in this building, I think is uh, shown to be missing. Um, so that maybe that's for the final. So it's not really a question. That's more for the final discussion. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for that. And I mean, in, before um, my talk, Ulf Meyer in the chat was lamenting that many of his students just scroll through the internet in order to find um, probably precedents for their projects. I know my students do that too. Um, if, if I don't speak with them very, very briskly, but um, that's, that's part of the problem. I mean, once this narrative gets out there and you know, now with the internet, everyone can be a critic, everyone can have very professional looking blogs and these, these narratives tend to, um, tend to take off and develop a life of their own and they're not looked at very critically once they start rolling. So that's maybe it. That's maybe the main issue I was looking at here, not so much the lead, um, what lead is, but really how these narratives get constructed and who's constructing them and for what purpose. Well, um, Jean, I, th I think we have to leave your question till later. Um, and, you know, look, there's a question about discipline, the discipline of architecture and the discipline of timekeeping. And I'm sorry that I have to jump in here, but uh, we have to adopt a little bit more rigor to this. Otherwise, we will not uh, allow others to have their time slot. So, um, uh, Fernando, if I can... Uh, Yes. I suggest that we have the break now and we return at 25 past the hour. So there's a six minute break um, from now. And let's try and be a little bit more um, um, disciplined about the time. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's not you, your fault. It's, every, it's accumulated, right? It's, yes. I, and there I'm, are I'm there, there are many questions, so it's uh, yes, yes. I'm it's, sorry, so many questions are, are left fine. to be discussed. Yeah, I think it, you're right. See you. Uh, see you later. Uh, Blaze, you are ready to. Um, you're ready uh, in at 25 yes. past, okay? Of course, so yes. There will be an introduction and uh, you will start. And uh, yes. I hope you can stay within the 15 minutes, please. Okay, I will do my best. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
Chengul. Yes, dear Wilfred, may I ask for something? I'm not a good timekeeper. Could you do <laughs> that for me? <laughs> yes, please. I lost, I, I lost my sense of time. <laughs> no, wait for me, precious. Well, uh, Tarkovsky is an architect and art historian, assistant professor at University of Lodz, Holland. In his research, he focuses on post-war modernist architecture and relations between architecture and politics. He is going to present us his work titled The Lost Battle for Memory, Why Does Architectural Criticism in Poland Remain Silent? You can start. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, my presentation will be a short story about the shipyard in Gdańsk. Uh, the site I consider as a very symbolic one and as a battlefield of the lost battle for the memory. Uh, the shipyard in Gdańsk uh, became one of the symbols of uh, post-socialist transformation in Poland. It was the place where uh, the first independent trade union in communist Poland was born. It was the Solidarity Trade Union in Polish, Solidarność. Uh, then it was the place where the collapse of the communist system started. And uh, three decades uh, after uh, those historical events, authorities decided to commemorate them uh, by raising a new building the European Solidarity Center. And uh, nowadays, as uh, the leading narrative in Poland is the neoliberal one, this building, the European Solidarity Center, uh, provokes many questions. What is the role of the center in the narrative about the uh, space of the uh, Gdańsk shipyard and the recent history of Poland? What message, both intentional and unintentional, which is even more important sometimes, is transmitted by the architecture of European Solidarity Center. And finally, what does this uh, building tell us about the role of architectural criticism in contemporary Poland, and then the condition of contemporary architecture? Uh, the European Solidarity Center was supposed to become a manifestation of great success of a bloodless revolution, of post-socialist transformation in Poland. And at the same time, the monument to the creation myth of the First Polish Republic. Uh, it was supposed to tell us a story of uh, this bloodless revolution and its heroes who led Poland and Poles from real socialism, from a socialist economy uh, to the capitalist promised land and from communist oppression to democracy. Uh, during the official inauguration, the president of Poland uh, recalled the people who uh, nowadays are perceived as icons of the Polish road to democracy. And one of uh, those people was, of course, former president Lech Wałęsa, who mm, uh, spoke about the current role of solidarity movement and current role of European Solidarity Center. Uh, he said, once again, we will gather together the people who will remind us how to win in a different way. Those people will search for the solutions to contemporary problems in contemporary times. That's what he said. And the crowd cheered after each sentence. But in fact, the, those people the former president was talking about, were not present. Uh, we can see Lech Wałęsa during the inauguration with all the media representatives, and of course some uh, representatives of the authorities as well, in general, the elites. Uh, but those people who created this original solidarity movement, who uh, raised the strike, who started the collapse of the communist systems, these were workers, the shipyard workers who were not invited. As 
uh, Grzegorz Klaman, one of the artists closely related to the Gdańsk shipyard, uh, um, said, uh, workers were standing far away from the European Solidarity Center behind the fence, and they watched the whole celebration as they would watch monkeys in the cage. So the grand opening of European Solidarity Center has become a manifestation of a very specific, very certain vision of the recent history of Poland and the parade of self-proclaimed self depositaries of the memory. And the relics of the memory of solidarity were placed in a building, which in my opinion is kind of a reliquary made of steel, made of concrete. It's the European Solidarity Center. According to the designers, according to architects, the building as a whole was intended to support the story about the heritage of solidarity movement and the place where it was born, the Gdańsk shipyard. It was supposed to testify about hope, heroism, and the desire for freedom. But as it often happens, the intended narrative turned it into its own parody. And uh, when um, considering the European Solidarity Center concept with a bit of criticism and a bit of irony, we can clearly read it in this way. The European Solidarity Center uh, is built on two different levels, the architectural envelope and the exposition, exposition inside. Uh, both equally and once again against the designer's intentions present the history of how the Warsaw and Gdańsk-based allies have stolen the legend of the people's social movement. Because we have to remember that so solidarity was in fact the bottom-up bottom movement and professional politicians appeared later. Uh, now we can see different approach. This is Grzegorz Klaman, the artist I already mentioned, and his narrative about Lech Wałęsa, a little bit Catalan's like sculptures with, using which he wants to confront with the myth of the president uh, of free Poland. Uh, the first and the same time, the most uh, eye-catching aspect is the location of the center of the uh, solidarity in relation to the shipyard. The building uh, was erected near the uh, gate, which is a kind of a symbolic place, very important one. Uh, the monument uh, dedicated to the fallen shipyard workers, which were uh, murdered by uh, the communist authorities in 1970 protests, and near two sculptures or installations created by Klaman, uh, which we can see on the right-hand side uh, pictures, which uh, refer um, to the site specificity, uh, the um, uh, bodies of the ships constructed in the shipyard, and the collapse of the communist system, because as you can see, the uh, top right-hand corner picture is a deconstructed Tatlin's uh, Felt International Tower. So it is a symbol of the communist utopia, which decay or deconstruction started in Gdansk. And we can easily indicate different strategies of commemoration uh, with those, those examples. Uh, the gate has become a historical monument and a leading memoir, uh, even though it was originally a purely utilitarian infrastructure element. The monument with those three monumental uh, crosses uh, imposes one dominant official narrative about the history. At the same time, Klaman installations elude any obvious simple interpretations and uh, attempts to place the heritage of the solidarity movement in a broader context. And in such extraordinary space, filled with different meanings, different symbols and different narratives, the building of European Solidarity Center has been raised. Uh, 
the architect Wojciech Targowski said that the building was supposed to become a platform for the social dialogue. The critics, the architectural critics, they spoke in the very, very similar manner and they followed the architect's narrative. The slanted reinforced concrete walls cladded with cotton uh, rusty panels were supposed to follow the original solidarity logo you can see in the picture as those letters they support one each other the same was supposed to be expressed with this uh, with these slanted walls at the same time the uh, rusty steel the curtain panels uh, were, were supposed to refer um, to the hulls of ships built in the shipyard. Uh, but being fully aware of the author's intentions, of architect's intentions, one should really consider if the message of the building is clear. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, 21st uh, century, the history of transformation, the history of solidarity uh, is increasingly the subject of critical analysis uh, and maybe it's time uh, to revise the official narrative also by revising the official narrative about the european solidarity center building and the reconstruction of the myth can happen in many different ways from rebellion uh, to total negation uh, and one of the tools of revision can be irony. And the critical ironic analysis of architecture allows us to keep some distance and find the hidden meaning at the same time. So on one hand side, we have uh, this site specific, specific architecture. On the other hand side, maybe uh, the European Solidarity Center is the rusting uh, hull of solidarity con in the center of capitalism, or maybe it's a never completed ship that the failing shipyard in Gdańsk has never launched, or maybe the uh, sloping walls are the uh, sign that the collective activism in Poland has ended with the beginning of the solidarity movement, and nowadays it almost totally disappeared. We can find those hidden meaning also inside the huge mm, uh, internal atrium uh, was filled with greenery, which was supposed to support the idea of the natural, naturalization of the building and of the shipyard. But at the same time, the plants we can see here have nothing to do with the plants that grow in Gdańsk. Uh, Grzegorz Klaman ironically comments that this is the aesthetics of the shopping mall. And it's hard to disagree with him uh, because we can easily imagine implementing a new program, new functional program inside an office, a commercial uh, program, or a leisure function. Uh, it provokes the reflection that the architecture of the European Solidarity Center does not uh, support the idea of the exhibition. It's not akin to Libeskind's Jewish Museum in Berlin, where the space, not really the exhibits, create the narrative. In here, we have rather a monstrous cotton cladded reliquary in which the mm, memorabilia of Solidarity Saints have been placed. Uh, and those memorabilia, memorabilia are related to Anna Valentinovich. You can see the overhead crane in which she worked. We have the one of the uh, electric cars repaired by Lech Wałęsa. And we have a lot of pictures, uh, archive pictures with those who run the strikes and run the solidarity. Uh, even more uh, convincing that the architecture of the European Solidarity Center in itself, it's its relation to the uh, shipyard. Because um, 
the building is gradually drifting apart from the shipyard itself. Uh, new buildings are being raised around it. The white street was created and the cotton cladded body of the building is not the part of the shipyard anymore. It's part of the new town with housing, build, uh, multifamily housing with uh, office buildings. Uh, and maybe it's also one of those unintended symbols because as the building has drifted apart from the shipyard, the same way the uh, myth and the idea of solidarity was taken away from Gdańsk, was taken away from the people, from the workers, and it hit the political salons and was absorbed by liberal or neoliberal work. Uh, but what does it have to do with architectural criticism? Uh, well, uh, I already mentioned that um, the articles, the um, critics about the building uh, repeat the official architects, designers narrative. Why is it so? Why the architectural criticism in Poland remain silent or remain polite. Maybe it's because uh, they use solidarity instead of solidarity. Uh, one of the very, very important uh, unwritten laws of architectural community in Poland uh, is uh, professional, the idea of professional solidarity is the idea to avoid criticism. At the same time, Polish architects uh, often um, avoid connecting architecture with politics. They rather see it as a pure art based on Vitruvian ideas uh, and not a tool of politics. Of course, we can also think about architectural criticism as uh, something which can spoil the business. And in neoliberal architectural work in Poland, architecture is business. So criticizing new investments can uh, be a, let, let's say, way of spoiling it. Uh, fortunately, we can find some hope for the future looking at the approach taken recently by Polish historiography. Maybe in some time, architecture will follow. But so far, the European Solidarity Center has not received a reliable critical architectural analysis and neither had uh, other different, other important contemporary buildings. Uh, the European Solidarity Center has been merely described as the new icon of Dansk and the beginning of former shipyard transformation without any deeper thoughts. And thoughtlessly repeated platitudes do not have a positive impact on architecture itself. On contrary, lack of real architectural criticism impoverish architecture, deprive it on the multidimensional characteristic, which arises from many interpretations, not only one dominant official narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Blasie, for this very interesting and inspiring presentation. And after having listened, except one, I have listened uh, to all presentations. And the striking thing I uh, came up with is that uh, the perspective and principles of criticism uh, change uh, whether we are dealing with a corporate building or a symbolic building, uh, public response in terms of public response, user response, and architect's response. Uh, that was interesting. I, I just found out. Uh, and um, this being a very symbolic case, uh, I thought of uh, different uh, categories of criticism. 
maybe later you know, we uh, the members of and the organizers could talk about this further this was a discovery in my case any more questions well, mine was a statement not a question uh, is there any hands raised that i can see fernando do you have any question Yes, please, Wilfred, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Blase. Blase. Um, there are many aspects, and I think that uh, when you say, yes, there's one way of dealing with this, uh, with a sense of uh, critical irony, I think that um, um, that kind of approach is very well developed in Eastern Europe, I think. Um, more so than other parts of the world. Uh, to me, uh, the, this building looks like uh, um, a breaking, uh, uh, an arc that is breaking up uh, or a series of ship's hulls that are uh, rusting uh, yes. in, you know, in, in a port somewhere. It's uh, very, very sad um, symbolically uh, and probably not at all intended. Uh, so, um, there is an irony in the uh, the lack of sensitivity to the uh, irony that this building uh, actually represents uh, in terms of architecture. Um, but let me stop there. And I think that um, uh, in your text, I hope it will become clearer um, where official um, statements have been made in, in the kind of the dominant media and uh, why they have taken such a um, tepid uh, stance. Um, for me, it's, I think your term reliquary, reliquary is a very apt one. And uh, it is also apt because of your, what was a kind of Catholic culture. Um, I think that there's a kind of penchant uh, for um, uh, bowing down to uh, uh, these kinds of objects and it turns everything into um, uh, a shrine uh, in the end and, and uh, buries things uh, in, in, in a certain way. Uh, so the effect of uh, trying to carry forward the flame of Solidarność uh, has completely turned uh, the other direction. It's, it's literally put an end to that. It's very sad. Uh, thank you, Wilfred. Oh, uh, yes, you are uh, totally right that it's the idea, because it was a competition, architectural competition, and the decision to choose this concept, this project, is the sign of the lack of sensitivity when we think about the uh, thousands of unemployed people from the shipyard in early 90s and uh, these ruined buildings in the shipyard themselves. Uh, and thank you for this suggestion about the shrine and this Catholic culture, because uh, to be honest, uh, I didn't uh, think about it, maybe because I'm not really a religious person, uh, but uh, yes, that's, uh, that's the way we often deal with the concept of the memory and the buildings of the museums, not the platform for the dialogue, but uh, the place to bow down and the place to uh, play, in fact. That's, that's true. That's... Louis, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you for this um, presentation that brings back memory of way, way back when visit to Poland. Um, I One question is, because it really wasn't clear from the title and the presentation, the lack of criticism is in general or just for this building because it represents something as important and as revered as Solidarność. That's, one question. And the other question is why, if this building was supposed to be so important uh, related to that movement, why the space around 
was not provided for and is now being cladded by all type of commercial buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, yes, I should have done it uh, more clear. This building is uh, was uh, just uh, an example, very, very, in my opinion, uh, important one. Uh, example of this lack of criticism, because especially, I hope it will be more clear in the text, in the article, but uh, especially now in the uh, era of social media, of Facebook and so on, architects in Poland uh, are very, very, um, uh, let's say, unwilling to start any critical discussion because uh, quite often any attempt of critical analysis is considered as an attack. It's one, on one hand side. On the other hand side, I mentioned this solidarity of the architects in Poland because uh, we have architects who give awards to another architects and uh, they are somehow protecting the business of the group because this let's say neoliberal mentality is really really strong in poland so architecture is business and criticizing architects can spoil the business that's one thing and uh, answering uh, to the to the second question uh, well, uh, this building was supposed to be uh, an icon of Gdańsk and one of the most important buildings in Poland nowadays, contemporary buildings. But at the same time, this mm, liberal or neoliberal uh, approach is an answer to what happened around it. Because, uh, well, the uh, area of the shipyard has been divided into smaller parts and sold to private developers, to private companies. And uh, uh, authorities of uh, the city, they uh, rather see it as the, let's say, new center of Gdańsk or the uh, new town with uh, mostly office buildings or residential buildings, then a large, uh, public space, uh, and in my opinion, is uh, something totally wrong. That's, for example, why uh, there is no chance for the Gdańsk shipyard to become, to become a world heritage site of uh, UNESCO, even though the attempts are now being made, but probably no chance. Thank you very much. Just add a little thing. Uh, to your response that architects are not willing to criticize other architects, but I understand that is solidarity, like you said, but uh, criticism is not supposed to be by the architects themselves. They're supposed to be architectural historians and critics that do that. That's it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Professor Tcharkovsky. It was very interesting and the following debate was very teaching. And now uh, <clears throat> I'm going to invite uh, the final uh, group of contributors uh, to the Congress. Uh, Professor Erkaslan will present uh, the group. Özlem Erdoğdu Erkaslan is a professor of architecture at Istanbul Aydın University, Turkey. Her research is focused on gender and architecture, anti-orientalism and architectural criticism. Dr. Murat Burak Altınışık is a lecturer at Pamukkale University, Denizli, Turkey. His research concentrate, its research concentrate on the history and theory of architecture. Dr. Mustafa Batu Kepekcioğlu is an assistant professor at Doğuş University, Istanbul, Turkey. His interests are in practice, theory, 
and criticism of architecture. And the title of the presentation is The New IMPS and Multiperspectival Criticism in Contemporary Turkish Architecture. And you got 15 minutes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Professor Şengül Emengür. Uh, today I will be presenting, but we, the other two co-authors uh, will be present here, especially for the questions and answers section. Criticism in the Turkish architectural scene is mostly delineated to attesting the non-conceptual intentions of the architect and granting a quasi-theoretical perspective to the built form. What is expected is neutral criticism, a verbal form characterized as to be limited to a particular interpretation of the design intentions of the architect. Such a mindset reduces the critic to the position of an apologist and criticism to tautology. The presentation here, as well as the article submitted to the conference, may be considered as a counterposition to constitute and declare dissent from such single-minded propositions and positions. The paper experiments a different type of architectural criticism, an edited version of three critics, us, progressively exchanging ideas about a singular building. It is also crucial to mention that we as authors used cross-references to the architect so that the readers can easily discern his tone as the fourth author. Today, we will try to reflect on our textual method as well as its content during the presentation. However, it is needless to say that the text itself is more vivid and it's an example of creative writing more than this presentation can cover. Uh, we criticized the Istanbul Museum of Painting and Sculpture designed by Emre Arulat architects in Salupazara, which is the transformation of an existing warehouse building called Entrepot Number no. 5, designed in the 1950s by Sedat Akka Eldem. Although Eldem's and Arulat's practices represent two different types of architectural culture in Turkey, both are seen as competent, successful, and appreciated according to their own time and conditions. Eldem is widely respected in Turkish architectural culture as the legendary name of modern architecture in Turkey and a very influential professor of the Academy of Fine Arts. Emre Arulat may be considered as the contemporary equivalent of Eldem in the current architectural scene. He is bold, determined, semi-international, and controversial. He is a graduate of Mimar Sinan University, formerly known as the School of Fine Arts, or shortly the Academy, where Aldem was a lifetime professor and a director. The Academy is the common denominator for both architects who graduated from this school. The website of EAA, the official name of Arulat's office, defines the strategy of transformation as keeping the concrete structure while removing the walls and slabs to acquire a convenient void to position the containers. The museum interior is described as an open space, visually connected to the scenes of Istanbul, which will be viewed from the ramps and bridges passing from one container gallery to the next. The terms that Arulat used to verbalize his strategy cause a series of confusing interpretations, which will be argued here. The arguments are based on the contradiction between the biases of the architect and facts to question the sincerity, authenticity, and integrity of the building. The title reflects the method and emphasizes the multi-perspectival approach. Following the criticism of each author, the other two responded with a comment which gives us the main flow of the text. The second layer attempts to explore how Arulat redefines concepts while appointing himself as the guardian of Eldam legacy, which provides a chance to make another reading of authorship. We are looking at, now we are looking at his early sketches in the slide. So we would like to talk about the advices uh, of the architect versus the facts we determined. Arulat repeatedly emphasizes that the former building was preserved by means of using a structural grid. Additionally, he also directly provides conceptual links to the term carcass, 
which is acclaimed to be the archetypal and peculiar element of traditional Turkish architecture by Elda. Foremost, the street wing of the former building was reconstructed with modifications, as you may see in the slide. The other three facades are already altered by the addition of red boxes, which means that for an outsider viewer, the original grid has already disappeared. Yes, maybe it is mimicking the original, but there is no trace left from it. Um, just secondly, EAA claims that the project is sensitive to the collective memory by keeping some traces of the site, such as using containers as a ready-made. As a part of his concept context description, the official presentations of Arolat displayed the containers as if they had already been there waiting to be upcycled. However, there had been no containers on the site ever before. The screenshots taken from his own website, the picture on the uh, left, show the containers present just next to the building, which was taken inside the grid by a crane. Arulat may have assumed the existence of the containers in an older port, but there were no containers on the site at any time of history, as the historical photographs show us. The exhibition boxes labeled as containers in the museum are not infrastructural plugins, but rather spectacular installations of the building hardware. Shockingly, the boxes are not stacked within the structural grid. Instead, they are conventionally fabricated in stew and fixed onto the framework. Although EAA describes the containers housing the museum collection as white cubes, and refers to them as neutral spaces. The superimposition of the existing structural system and the containers leaves beams and columns exposed at unexpected parts of the gallery. The slide shows one of the interiors of the so-called white cube. Actually, the creative writing process in this paper gives us a flow of criticisms and counter commands which follow one another. The slide now we are looking at introduces us and our singular points of view, which will be introduced in the rest of the presentation. You're looking at the pictures of myself, Bottu, and Burak. Uh, just uh, for making uh, the presentation easier, uh, Burak uh, and Bottu and my comments are uh, just uh, marked with singular colors so that you can easily understand. Uh, Brock's criticism, uh, Arulat prefers to call the grid carcass borrowed from Eldam's theoretical approach. He assumes that preserving the structure and stripping it provides him with the context and situation rather than an architecture of icons. Umberto Eco discloses most of our architectural practice as a system of rhetorical structure. It's a profession characterized by addressing people to fulfill certain requirements and convincing them to live in a particular way. As mentioned before, both container and the carcass are fictional images, gestures of an absent signifier. In other words, the museum rhetorically resides in mythic connotations of the industrial and the port, while it smoothly rationalizes discursive assumptions of place and context. Therefore, it can be claimed that the references are not tools for anchoring the conceptual to the corporeal, but our intellectual codes that, that appeal to the reception of both professional and non-professional spectators of the building. Now we will just look at the counter commands for Burak. First of all, my command comes, um, there are special advantages of reconstructing the entrance part. The new edition bestowed a modest narrative space by raising the height of the interior and provided an opportunity for the visitor to face the original grid upon entering the building. The grandiose gallery granted by the freestanding facade brought a dramatic entry to the building. On the other hand, the replica by definition cannot be traded with the authentic, which results in the dissatisfaction of those who wished for the preservation of the former Entropo Five. And a comment by Batu, it is difficult to claim that Aron Lutz Museum achieved to be the antithesis of iconic architecture, even though he intended to position himself so. 
The eye-catching images of the so-called container cantilevers are sparkled with red LEDs, accentuating the new intervention and becoming indistinguishable from any other iconic architecture piece. This building is marketed with the help of images, narrowly framing the red cantilevers without giving any clues about its surroundings. Arulat attempts to establish the coexistence of sterile and non-sterile spaces, but his material and detailing choices contradict the inter in intention. Um, Batu's criticism uh, just commented as, uh, firstly, the elongated or enlarged exhibition units, so-called containers, become gallery capsules located almost adjacently being deprived of any dimensional logic. However, what was groundbreaking about the container is the dimensional standardization that leads to modulation. Consequently, the circulation areas fall far from being bridges linking container exhibition units as a design commitment and instead become dull corridors. Secondly, the intended three-dimensional spatial experience is not fulfilled even though the irregular planimetric superimposition at different levels forms a series of vertical voids. The same layout is mostly repeated throughout the building volume, which creates only a cacophony. Therefore, it is inevitable to question why the former structure had been exposed to such demolition since the hollowed out grid has been refilled with new floors. My response, as mentioned above, a container as a standardized component has the capacity to create industrial image and reflect the eco-friendly conscious consumerism by means of upcycling and recycling. But in this example, their existence of red capsules can only be judged at the representative realm. The cantilevered columns speak out loudly and create a second rhythm superimposed on the pattern of reinforced structural grid of the original building, the signature of EIA on the facade that he inherited from Eldam is a clear manifestation of the temporality of architecture, which may be described as the only fairness of the building. Brock's response comes as, once the design is confined to stripping the carcass, the options on how to refill the acquired void becomes a challenge. As the first impression, employment of containers to overcome the challenge may appear as a convincing motive. Yet not only the denotional, yet not only the denominational, but also the connotational aspect of containers lead to certain incompatibility issues. As infrastructural vessels of logistics, containers are temporary nests used for transporting commodities. However, most of the museum collection that is hosted in the containers belongs to a world of a profoundly different mindset that is preconceived with notions of permanence canon, lineage, and other fixed values. In this sense, the proposed architectural design does not seem to problematize such conceptual challenges between the content and the context it presupposes. And um, my critique, the museum is an adaptive reuse project, although it was not labeled under this category, neither by the EAA nor by the professional community. Many people shared this uh, the, their dissatisfaction stemmed from not seeing more of the original building in the end product. The original warehouse building is not one of the significant buildings of Eldam and had not been given any space in the existing literature prior to the museum project. This simply tells us that the public was not very interested in the building and it was out of the radar of the architectural historians prior to the refurbishment plan. Anachronic and random selection of terms and themes from the historical references create a mismatch of concepts and underlines a deep inconsistency in the design process. When Batu commented uh, against my criticism, he said, it is clearly understood that preservation of the existing building was not imposed on the architect by third parties. In one of his speeches, he is also telling that during the initial stages of the project, the members of the Cultural and Natural Conversa Conservation Board questioned the decision of keeping the existing building, which had not been officially listed. Moreover, the board did not further insist on preservation of the other buildings in the coastal line, which had similar, similar characteristics on the 1950s. At this point, 
the importance of preserving LDEM's former Entropo number five becomes more important since it became the only remaining landmark expected to carry the urban memory of Salupazari district as well as LDEM himself. And Burak commented as follows, the crucial point of convergence seems to be the biographical backgrounds of the two architects pertaining to the institution as graduates of the School of Fine Arts. Whether a significant building or not, the entrepôts and the offices were formally designed by Eldem and the project was granted to Ar Arolat by the university administration as one of their graduates. Such lineage is convincingly legitimizing at different communal levels. Although the former building was a relatively important project in Eldem repository, the name solely provides a practical alibi to oppose the ongoing demolition and construction scene. It helps to persist in preserving the structure as the initial step for a continuity in collective urban memory. And probably we are all familiar by now with Eric Hobsbawm's concept of invented traditions, which argues that many traditions that appear or claim to be old are often quite recently constructed and invented. The argument refers to a phenomenon that is particularly clear in creating a national identity to promote national unity and legitimize certain institutions or cultural practice. By taking this as a common measure between Eldem and Arolat, our multi-perspectival criticism has taken us to this diagram. Within this frame, Sadat Hakka Eldem stands out as the protagonist of such tradition invention in the Turkish architectural scene. His analysis on traditional Turkish houses is based on the wooden skeleton system as the core of the tradition to be translated into the modern architecture and reinforced concrete. However, the clean, neutral reinforced concrete structure of the Eldam design here reflects the practical and semi-industrial uh, purpose of the building, and it's not deeply associated with his car class motif anymore. Although it was claimed to be so by EAA. The term carcass is a theme that is valid for Eldam's residence, built before 1950 and derived from vernacular examples. It is very irrelevant to attribute it to the buildings he built in the international style after the 1950s. What we tried to argue in the article was that invented context is not a concept that runs an uh, omnipotent and omnipresent or generic validity, but a sustained reinvention attempt for the particular or the singular. Such contextual reinvention seems crucial in the urban conditions, especially as in the case of Istanbul. Arolat de deliberately uses the term carcass and instrumentalizes tectonics by following the footsteps of Eldam to generate, or let's say create, context and legitimize his line of thought. The building is a typical example of his arbitrary preferences, which EAA picked from his own, with his own words, his basket of data and blended with an iconic image like the so-called container. The text revealed a set of concepts that were instrumentalized by EAA for his invention of context. Eldam's approach merging the modern and the traditional is described as invention of tradition. Both Eldem and Arolat use tectonics to rationalize their approach, one for his invented tradition, the other for his invented context. The alignment is one of the original results of this paper. Although their methods of research are similarly reductionist and arbitrary, both architects see turned into different blocks of professionalism and authorship. The engagement between the former skeleton and the new intervention seems to face the reciprocality between Eldem and Arolat, both lost in translation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, it was uh, interesting in many respects. However, without having observed the building, I will not be the one to comment. So uh, I'm asking the audience if there are any questions.
Yes, Wilfred. Well, uh, um, I found this uh, very enlightening and I um, uh, would like to congratulate uh, the team on this multi-perspectival presentation. I think you've been able to dig at uh, the many, many um, issues, both uh, contradictory as well as uh, problematic, um, from the conceptual to the detail. Um, I think there's uh, a future in this, if, if it only were uh, financially possible to support this kind of multiperspectival criticism. So uh, I think there's obviously a limitation to it, but uh, in any case, um, the multiperspectival nature of it uh, um, offers, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's the four eye or six eye concept that uh, more people, uh, see more things and uh, are able to therefore raise questions. Uh, the real tragedy in both uh, um, Brazé's and, and your presentation is that um, criticism in this case, as in actually most cases, comes too late and the building is constructed uh, and all the errors and faults are, are, are visible. Um, but uh, to this particular museum, it is another example where architects use a certain concept, the carcass and you know, the idea of the containers, um, where so, so naive is this concept that uh, clearly they are pulling the wool over pe people's eyes. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's shutting out criticism from the beginning by trying to be as simple and as naive as possible, uh, so that the, the concept appears faultless. In fact, the, the concept is completely uh, filled with, uh, uh, you know, it, it's just nonsense. It's Eisenmanian nonsense, <laughs> right? And um, Eisenman's been able to get away with things like this as other colleagues like him. And it's just resulted in uh, disasters. Uh, I mean, you presented the plan and it, it, it just, uh, the mind boggles uh, how, you know, even client organizations can accept something like that. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, thank you for your comment, uh, Wilfred. Uh, actually, just the process of the construction of this building uh, was a little bit closed for the public. I mean, just um, we didn't understand what was preserved, what was not preserved, whether uh, the uh, containers were real containers or not real containers until we see the building. Just first of all, the overall site was covered with high walls and uh, we couldn't approach it. And the only information flow was given by the architect himself and we could follow it. We traced it back while we, are, we were doing research from his videos. And uh, just uh, there were no chance for any of the critics to uh, make comments before the building was inaugurated. Um, this, that was, you know, something because just, just the construction took so long, about six years with the setbacks. Uh, and the whole process was closed for the public's eye. Let me just say one, <laughs> one thing before uh, William speaks. Uh, I commend you and Brazé for uh, speaking up. Uh, we are living in a period where um, uh, criticism is not at all welcome, not just in countries like uh, Turkey and Poland, but also in countries like Germany. Um, for example, I've been speaking up against a design by a Swiss uh, architectural team uh, here in the center of Berlin. And uh, the minister of state in charge of this project at a meeting with other people, uh, when my, my name came up said that I am burned earth, right? So just, just to say that these notions of where whether criticism can be spoken freely without uh, recriminations and personal consequences. Um, I, I commend that you are willing to, to speak up and I commend Brazé for that, doing that, knowing the consequences that are possible, not just in your country. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, please, uh, William Curtis. Michael, we have to unmute your microphone, uh, William. You've been able to to uh, work the, the, the raised yes, hand. But I've got the hand and now I've got the sound. Um, I, I thank you very much for this interesting uh, uh, reflection, um, which, um, you know, I happen to know the place uh, uh, reasonably well. Um, and um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is broaden the discussion a little bit on the basis of the last uh, uh, two presentations. Um, first of all, um, I think that um, there is the challenge to power. Um, one of the functions of criticism is to pose difficult questions to political power. George Orwell put it so well. Um, and of course, architecture is one of the uh, devices which is used to legitimize uh, the powers in, in, in place. Um, and I believe that one of the functions of architectural criticism is to work through that. So years ago, uh, to mention a case which I was involved in, I wrote um, uh, the, the only article that criticized the Grand Projet published in 89, uh, was called Machine d'Etat, uh, the Grand Projet. And it was looking not only at architectural issues and devaluation of modernism, but the extreme centralization of power in France and of technocracy. So this is an area which is important. Second point, which applies partly in a place like Turkey, but even more in the Middle East. We've, I think there are no um, uh, presentations that I've seen uh, looking at the kind of issues which are confronting many countries of the world, especially countries in, in, involved with Islam, with the problem of re symbolic representation and the avoidance of trivialization of tradition. So I would suggest this is an area which could be opened up. Years ago, I was involved in all those debates with the Aga Khan people criticizing what they did and so on. But the third point, which is a much more general one about what I've been listening to for the two days and even looking at the YouTube, is I do think at a certain level, uh, one has got to come down to issues of architectural idea and architectural form. Um, you know, the problem with the pro project you've just shown is that it's, it's not a very good idea and it's rather trivial, whatever you think the background is. The same goes for the, um, the project in Poland. It's a stack of cliches. You know, it, it's really a, no authenticity at all. He's bundled together images from here, there and everywhere and stuck it there on this, uh, on this site. So this is a plea uh, for very few of the presentations I've listened to finally get down to the object and deciphering it and exploding it in architectural terms. You say, you know, why is this a good idea or not a good idea? And if it's a good idea, is it well expressed? Is it et cetera, et cetera? So I would hope to um, ease the discussion if we're going towards the end game, towards some of these more general questions of the functions of criticism, all the way from, you know, we've seen very interesting examples of the problems of political representation down to, is this a good idea? Is it a good skyscraper? I don't care whether it's lead or not. Is it a banal skyscraper? Is it a, a you know, formally uninteresting skyscraper? Issues of form have been a little bit, I think, um, downgraded in the, in, in the discussion. And what I would call architectural ideas, and by that I don't mean theoretical ideas, I mean the driving concepts of buildings and whether they are appropriate or not, and whether they're expressed uh, in, in genuine and authentic terms in the, the final object. So these are questions as much as anything. Thank you very much. Very valuable contribution. I would like to uh, build a bridge uh, to the first speaker, the keynote speaker uh, of today uh, by, uh, while I agree with William that uh, it is necessary to be uh, sharp in the focus and to uh, look at the evidence, the built evidence. Um, I think the topic uh, that, the central topic that Philippa has brought up, uh, that is that we need good architectural criticism as a way to prepare good architecture. Uh, without good architectural criticism, we are not going to have good architecture because there's no way of disciplining um, the, the designers uh, as, you know, as simple as that. And the other thing that Philippa brought up is the, the need uh, for architecture not to be just uh, serving its own discipline of the, the form making and, and, and the, the inside rules of 
what is good architecture and logical and you know well well designed and so on but that it serves a purpose it serves society it serves people it serves users uh, and um, there are instances and uh, the presentations this afternoon were full of them Lynette pointed to the to the hour zero of German uh, democracy where uh, you know, uh, everything lay in, uh, in ruins and uh, a country had to reconstitute itself. And in, in South Africa, the constitutional court was a way of reconstituting itself. Philippa, and I don't, I don't remember that you mentioned the fact that uh, the constitutional court uh, is on the site or it uses parts of a former prison. Right, and I, I think you you mentioned prison briefly, but I don't think the audience uh, was made aware that the constitutional court is like you know a uh, sword into plowshares, uh, a prison into a constitutional court. It's an extraordinary example of a complete symbolic uh, conversion of something that was a part of a terror machine. something. Um, Blaise's uh, remark on this uh, architecture as business differs from uh, uh, Filipinas. Wrong, I suppose. Uh, learning from uh, architect, learning from Las Vegas is kind of a uh, so resource for architecture as business. And the uh, South African model as learning from the community seems, you know, seems a different approach or kind of conceptualizing architecture in a different way. So maybe we can also <clears throat> discuss these issues. I mean, architectural, uh, architecture has been somehow uh, defined by the traditions of, you know, European, let's say, uh, theoretic uh, conceptualizations, but now there's more, let, um, not very formal, but informal ways of architectural uh, constructions also around the world, especially the case of African uh, models is also a debate in Turkey at some points at local levels. But there is also a growing a tendency to kind of uh, boundless architects around the world uh, working on this topic also, not the official record of architecture as in the history we see, but somehow in a uh, very uh, practical everyday life uh, level. Um, but of course, these are different aspects. I mean, all these, um, how can I say this? Maybe it's about the last, last week's uh, on, on this architecture of corporate, corporatism, architecture of everyday life, or architecture of informal, or architecture of the communities. These are all very intriguing issues, it seems. Um. I don't know if I could, could add on to that. I think in, in South Africa, well, well uh, there's always a fear that if you allow for society or community to, to collaborate within an architectural design process, that you're going to somehow affect the, the quality or, the, or the, the gravitas that the architecture has. But with the examples that I showed, and they're not the only ones, actually within the, there's an embodied knowledge um, within communities that I think as architects, we tend to overlook because we come in as experts. And I think it was um, Aristotle when he was, he was arguing for democracy. I'm not very, it's something that I know slightly briefly in passing. And he, 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 I think he started the notion of the citizen expert. You can't really know where the shoe pinches unless you're wearing the shoes. And if, if you start to engage the people who are wearing the shoes, not, not to say that they are going to drive either the form or the, or the it's, there's something in there. It's, uh, I'm not sure what the word is. There's, there's something in there that underpins that, that allows for us to, to move the architecture forward. Otherwise we get stuck within 
within some kind of other rhetoric or arguments that are very much abstract and that those don't usually land. Because I, I do think the role of the architectural critic is incredibly important because we're not going to move architecture forward with, without some kind of critique, but the critique has got to be, dare I say, relevant within the society in which it lands. Otherwise we might as well, you know, just have a, a small 40 people conversation and carry on in perpetuity. It's got to land within society and you've got to bring that society into the design process. Very good. Very good answer. Okay, um, it's Wilfred's turn. No, oh, it's, uh, it's uh, Elias uh, who... Um, oh, sorry, that. sorry, Elias. I didn't see okay. it. I was just <laughs> trying to get at the uh, fact that uh, he might be uh, ending the conversations. Uh, I for think we're time. entering already a new main one, Wilfred. Thank you. Yeah. Elias, of course yeah. I will listen. Sure, sure. Please. <laughs> <laughs> he may we wait. Some, <laughs> we've had some excellent um, presentations this afternoon, and I don't think we have uh, much time to talk about them. I'd like to, if there is time, to come back to the question that both yesterday and today William Curtis put regarding quality and, yeah. and form. Um, but for the moment, I would like to ask if I can, if I may, a question to Filippa. Uh, it seems like discussions since the previous weekend um, have very often come up with the problem of a neoliberal agenda. We have seen it in the presentations of today. And what came through very strongly through Filippa's lecture was this uh, idea of participatory design, community design, which is refreshed again today, and Anna Tosto has talked about it a lot. So, Filippa, uh, if uh, I, don't know, I do not know if you can or if you want to uh, comment, for example, on, I'd like to know what, what your opinion is about the social housing projects, the incremental ones by Alejandro Aravena. If you know them, in you know, much talked about in Monterey and Quinta Monroy. Is it something you would like to say something about? Because I think they're right there on the edge. Yeah. Between being philanthropic and uh, participatory and community oriented. And then there is critique of it being a kind of give a piece of bread. <laughs> of yeah. The yeah. Yeah. So that's the question. Um, I know of the projects, uh, but I haven't been been to the to the to the site. So I'm going Me to neither. So that's a danger. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to take based on talk about based on what I've I've seen presented and what I've I've re read read about it. What I've always found lacking in all the uh, the literature I've read on those projects is, I mean, there's a shell and then people infill, and that that kind of also at some point started picking up traction in South Africa. But what I've always found a little bit missing is if I give somebody a shell and we start to infill to create um, individuality and identity, I'm not I'm not sure who generates the shell because that's the that's the the, the problematic around the, the incrementalness of that type of architecture. But because if the boundaries of that shell um, limit the way that people make space or reappropriate space, then actually the shell doesn't work. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a, it's a very tricky, it, a couple of architects have tried it here and it hasn't really worked very well in this context because mm -hmm. then the architecture is defined by the shell. Mm -hmm. Whereas what, what I was trying to describe in those projects is that the architecture is defined by the people within that community. So, so I come in as an expert and I present a shell and then you've got to fill it up. You're, that That is a, like an, it's also landing in an alien way. You bring something into a community without actually, what I'm, what I'm suggesting, which could be different is that you should rather bring, get whatever is in the community out of it. You excavate it from the community, not impose it onto the community. But, but I've never been to the site and I've always found lacking in readings on that work, the, the level of, or the point from which those dimensions or that shell comes out from the communities in which it has been placed. Thank you. It's a very good answer. And the reason I asked 
I have not visited either, but it seems to come into education and, and uh, it's used as a paradigm by many colleagues. I can, and, I can uh, who have, say who something have not about it. So, Fernando, you might have some to say about it. Yeah. Uh, just to, to follow the, the example, uh, because I, I, I brought that example to a, a, a Congress on, on, on housing in Vienna in, 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 in 2008, I think, when it was still finishing. So I, I talk a lot with Aravena at that moment. And I think afterwards it served as a jumping platform for, well, yeah. for another thing. For, but, but this first project, uh, in this first project, uh, participation was very intensive. And, 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 and I think that at, at, uh, uh, quite, quite um, effective in terms of engaging the community and, and, and the, the specific fact that they the built in the, in the land they already had. In Quinta so, Monroy so or the, in Monterey? Uh, uh, um, um, Which is the first project. The first one, the first one. First one, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so I, I would uh, make a difference between this first Aravena project and the and the, the subsequent other others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, are we are we are we continuing, Wilfred? If so, uh, yes, please. Who is? Uh, Kevin Lowe and Chantal Blakely and Louise have questions. Yes, yes, they do. Okay. More, more of a, a comment than a question, actually, in, in relation to Aravena. Um, when he was the curator of the Venice Biennale a few years ago, he awarded, I think it was a silver bear, to the architectural project done by um, Kunle Adeyemi for the floating school in the Makoko. Uh, um, um, village in Lagos, uh, uh, which collapsed two weeks after it was awarded the Silver Bear. <laughs> I, I think the big problem with, with um, architecture and, and the way architects approach the, 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 the profession and, and the criticism of it too, is because we, are, we tend to be rather unspecific in relation to context. The reason why the school collapsed was because Ade Yemi was not interested in actually examining the problems that were, that were ex extant in, in the Makoko floating village. Firstly, it was not a floating village. It was shored up by very thin columns on the, on the, on the, on the uh, uh, seabed of the lagoon. And, and he called it a floating village because that's ro it was a romanticized uh, um, uh, vision of it, which of course was uh, sent virally globally by, by the famous architectural photographer, yeah, uh, um, Ivan Ban. Yeah. And, and, and by, by, call, by bringing in a global solution of a flotation device, he basically put the heaviest mass of this school on top of a raft. Now that's the opposite way a boat floats, you see. So this thing was never designed to float stably. He didn't understand that the village, all of the houses are built very close to each other because they shore each other up like an organism. So the outermost houses, are shored up by the ones inside of it. And, and by creating an iconic image for this floating school that you could then pull away from the rest of the community and, 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 and its iconic form, like, like, which actually resembles a sail of a boat without any kind of support underneath, it, it just blew over in, in, a, in a very bad storm. Now, I think this is the big problem is when we talk about context of community and society, we don't refer to the specific context or the specific community we're actually discussing. And, and the problems, the very specific problems that they, that they uh, um, share or the circumstances that they are, are entrenched in and in, in trying to push solutions that may not be appropriate at all, you know? So, sorry, just a comment in relation to Aravena and, 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 and everything else that we've been talking about uh, this conference. Thank you. Sorry, go Thank ahead. You. Yes, Louis, please. No, uh, Chantel Blakely. Oh, oh, sorry. I don't know the order. I see the no, hand. Uh, if you go to gallery view, you will see uh, the, the order. The order of the raised hands. They are in sequence okay. from left to right. Oh, Chantel Blakely. Oh. 
for, for the next next conference. <laughs> Hello, and thanks for taking my question. Um, I I have a question for Philippa. I was really I really enjoyed uh, the examples that you presented, and um, wh whenever I see these really compelling projects that seem to involve an architect who has somehow like taken into the process criticism. So it's criticism sort of before the fact in a way. Um, I really feel that this is something that should be more widely adopted. And then I wonder, so what are the sort of obstacles to the wider practice of architecture in this way? And one question I have, and I'm wondering what you think of this, is whether it's simply an, an ethos, let's say, so a matter of the architect's conscience and conscientiousness and empathy, uh, in which case maybe we should all, you know, teach architects and young architects to be more empathetic, or, or is there some possibility of speaking of a method of somehow uh, sort of formalizing uh, sort of principles or uh, like uh, Dieter Rams's name has come up and his uh, sort of principles of good design are sort of widely disseminated. Um, is there something like a method that stands to be defined for projects like the ones that, that you shared? Um, I don't think there's a set method, but, but definitely there's empathy, but I think it goes back to what Kevin was speaking about. If you're, it's, it's about being able to recognize and not, not just recognize, but recognize value within the specifics of the place that you are working. So um, I'm fortunate that I know all, all three architects and they are all very empathetic, but the one thing that they all do have is, is an incredible respect for place, not just site, place specific dynamics. H how do places operate? What makes them work? Because on the surface, when you walk into a place, if you go to, if you go to a place like Makassa, on the surface, you would think that's a very marginalized community. Um, there's all sorts of problematics in the urban environment. It's far away from the city. There's very little public infrastructure. But because Clint um, went out of his way to understand the place, well, he did also grow up there. He started to, um, with, with the, the kids in the community, start photographing the different ways of making and people who are using different materials differently in construction. For example, there was a series of photographs on people who are using, um, we call them soul pipes, but you know, the plastic plumbing pipes as structural um, features to construct double story structures. And when you start to realize that within every place, they, there's unique things that happen. I think that's one way that the architecture resonates in the place and it becomes incredibly strong, but, but you're also right is that all the three architects also have an incredible ability to be able to remove themselves as, as authors and designers and listen to either a critique or another story or another way of seeing things, which I think is their kind of, that's the superpower. You have, if you can remove yourself and allow for something else to come through, then the context speaks to you and then the, the solutions start to work a bit better. But I think between those two, there's no real method, but. Those are the two, the two characteristics in those three projects that I think the architects embody. Chantel, I think that uh, it's a, Philip has given you a very um, diplomatic answer. Uh, I, I would put it a little sharp, more sharply, and I would say, uh, unfortunately, many architects are trained to be egomaniacs. You know, they, they want to see their object associated with their persona. And, you know, everything is about the fight to realize one's concept in the form, right? And then there's also the object fetishism. So to overcome that, um, you really have to deconstruct the way that we have been teaching architecture, that you know, we have these great figures, the dead white males, right? The, the genii, the heroes, and it's that, of course, you know, these people, I mean, even Le Corbusier had a team uh, and, and yet everything is focused on the individual, right? So we are uh, suffering from that kind of pathology uh, and it's, uh, it's not going away any time soon. Uh, Louise, please. Uh, 
this brings us back to the canonical history of the <laughs> modern architecture, which is built on the geniuses, on the, the great figures, on the inspiration of the person. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and yes, we are those to blame because these come from the education. And I think we are all educators. Louise, please, and then Joao. Yes. And then, then we will have some general uh, final concluding remarks, okay? Yes, <laughs> my remark, I almost put down my hand after um, Philippa Sorry. explained again how the participatory uh, architecture is done in South Africa, opposing to what Aravena, and I quote him, does. One has to understand, and then I kept my hand up, and I think it relates to what Wilfred has just said now. Arabe, Aravena, that project is not only by Aravena, it's by Elemental and Aravena. And Elemental is a group of architects from Chile that went to Peru to study Previ and did a very good study of what really people needed then and was done or not done and what they probably needed in the, in the north of Chile. Then Aravena, that is a fantastic for self-publicity, took all the credit and Elemental disappeared. And then he became very important and he just took that example and put it in Monterrey and that's it. Come on, he, he didn't study, nobody studied what, hap what happened in Monterrey, was just put there, which I again think is not, it's not correct. And if we have to think of that type of buildings, let's remember what Balkrishna Doshi has been doing in India that people forgot about it. And I find that is very, um, coincidental that Aravena got the Pritzker Prize. And then next year, probably many people said, come on, you're giving it to somebody that is copying Doshi. They gave it to Doshi. That's my, at least my reading. And it's not a question, it's a comment. Thank you. João. Um, I was actually going to make a com comment also after Alexander Staub's presentation. And I think this, this whole discussion on the um, on the Bank of America Tower, it's very interesting in relates to everything that is being said now, that the good, the architectural qualities, and mainly when you touch on the subject of sustainability um, and related to all this, the way the culture is being transmitted nowadays through social media and so on, in which things are being flattered and, and they do not have uh, complexity and, and, and deepness. Um, the, all these things are, they're operating in a marketing logic, not as somehow a moral obligation, um, a, an ethic imperative. I think that's the main distinction about uh, some say like a, a neoliberal egocentric mentality and another one that is more focused on the, the duty of, of the architect concerning the public space and so on. And I personally, one thing that I found stunning in this presentation is that I also work in the corporate sector here in Brazil. And the, the budget uh, difference from these two countries is just um, gigantic. Uh, uh, the, all this discussion on, on embodied energy, for instance, uh, we, we cannot build a tower like this in Brazil, you know, it's, it's just simply too expensive. And most of the materials that are there and saying this being sustainable, we clearly here know that it, it's it's so costly to, to put those materials right there and they, they spend so much energy that we don't even think about that as sustainable in any sort. And I, so that's that's the, the my, my biggest worry is how, uh, the discourse nowadays is, is almost like the world's pushing to a new frontier where there's all these demands, the world is changing and so on. But in the same way, the, the way that the culture is being um, uh, discussed nowadays, it's getting more and more superficial and, and people are trying to reduce the, the complexity of things and that things that worries me a lot. Very good point, uh, Jean. Uh, William. 
Yes. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Am I heard now? Yes, no. you are. Yes. No, I know you are now. You switched off. You, you yes. switched it. Okay. Is it all right now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hands, sounds. I'm so glad that the name of Doshi uh, was, was brought up. Um, I had the pleasure of, um, you know, living a long time in India in the um, 80s. And one of the things that came out of that was the book, Balkrishna Doshi, an architecture for, for India. Um, and um, what I wanted to say is that um, Doshi, among several of his generation, including, uh, well, uh, you know, Charles Correa notably, um, we're very involved um, with what we can call the informal sector because it's the reality for millions and millions of people as a, a system of survival. And what, at what point does the formal designer have anything to do with that or to say to that or to add to it, to enhance it or to learn from it? Um, and the, these thoughts were applied with great depth and intensity by the Vestal Shilpa Foundation, for example, the group of researchers with Doshi and were reflected in projects like the indoor project, which some of you probably know, um, where the basic message is that uh, you can apply, you, you, you supply some basic infrastructure that uh, a modern technological architect can supply and some spatial guidelines that come from abstracting and understanding social patterns in the so-called slums and in the village, because often the village reproduces in the urban situation, uh, the same uh, spatial interactions and social interactions. And those are amazing resources of knowledge um, to be looked at again, those, those projects, including the new Bombay project by, by uh, Korea. But I think that this leads to a much larger idea of, of quote unquote, the question of tradition. Um, because, you know, one is tempted always to speak of the high tradition, and we haven't talked anything like enough about the long durée of architecture, uh, the quote unquote great works of the modern, which uh, somehow go back to basics. That's another discussion which has hardly occurred here. But no, I'm talking about tradition in the sense of the quotidien, the day to day, and its manifestation in the pattern and texture uh, of, of daily life. Um, and that is something one has to learn to read. And I believe we were hearing some very good examples of this for South Africa. Thank you, Philippa. But it's a worldwide problem. And I, I, I have only seen pictures of the Aravena projects. I'm not here to shoot holes in Aravena, but I, you know, I, I'm not sure what was going on in them. Um, and the fact of the matter is, I mean, I was in Lima a few years ago and went to see the Previ project, just now kind of embedded in the middle of nowhere. The reality is that most people are generating their own social spaces. Uh, around Lima, there are 11 million people who are reproducing the platform systems of the villages, uh, are creating um, you know, textures of living, including institutional structures of a certain kind of mixed social use, um, which have nothing to do with formal architects. The, a formal architect could come in at that point and say, I have all of this power here being given me by people to create spaces that suit them. How can I help them a little bit further, for example, with ventilation, with structure, with uh, access, with this, with that? It's the other way around uh, regarding, I won't say the, the architect is barefoot doctor, I discuss, I hate that idea, but it's going in and seeing there's the tissue of deep thought already available in the pattern of the so-called favelas. But favelas are a kind of knowledge, <laughs> a collective William, knowledge. William. Um, That's it. So. Yeah. Uh, let, let us try and uh, bring this conference to a, a conclusion. Oh, um, and, and may I just uh, offer, first of all, before uh, there, there are any other final comments, uh, thanks to all the participants, all the speakers, all the uh, presenters of the papers, uh, all the members of the scientific committee uh, and, uh, uh, my and you two, and you my, my two colleagues Trent Sexton and uh, Jean Navarrete uh, for their uh, untiring contribution and, and behind the scenes work. Um, I think this has been a terrific um, meeting. Uh, I've already mentioned we've saved tons of CO2 uh, in this format and I think it has a future. And I would like to suggest that we meet again on a topic uh, that is about quality, that is about integrity, that is about the relation between uh, society and architecture. And 
if integrity is a, a way of thinking about the integrity of the object, but also the integrity of architecture in relation to the context, both physical and cultural, mm. and integrity of a, a piece of architecture and society, that the way the society is constituted through architecture and represented through it, then we have a tool by which to measure quality. To what extent does a building contribute and not just suck the lifeblood out of uh, the financial system and the marketing system in order to uh, build up the client or the architect. So I think we have a topic uh, that we could meet. Uh, I, would, I would recommend that we think about it. Uh, please let's continue in this kind of uh, uh, email form and consider that we meet again um, next year in October or so uh, on this topic and I would like to suggest that uh, some of the presenters uh, who uh, presented the short papers join the scientific committee and uh, be part of a selection process that is arduous, uh, um, you know, requires reading and evaluation, and that uh, we can ask uh, some of the members of the scientific committee now uh, to serve again, but maybe also to present uh, papers to actually offer deep readings as uh, William suggested. So um, I will refrain from having the last word. I would like to give it to somebody uh, or to uh, a number of you, but we, we yeah, Fernando, we, we have to uh, come to an end and uh, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. We're going to have a book. So all the presenters and all the, um, those who have offered to write a text Please have it ready by the end of this month. Fernando. I, I think I'm speaking in, 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 in the name of, of the others uh, who are present here uh, to thank you, Wilfred Wang, for this extraordinary uh, event and uh, for uh, providing what Ruth Verdesen was asking for and what uh, mentioned Kenneth Frampton the first day in the words of Hannah Arendt, a space of appearance that flattens our presence and makes the two hemispheres of the world more equal, more horizontal, and to speak to each other in a more open and, and horizontal way. Thank you, Wilfred. Absolutely. Thank you, Wilfred, and thank you, Fernando, for representing the committee. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, and, and thank you, uh, uh, all those members from across the world. It has been extraordinary, and I think it is the way of the future. Um, I'm, uh, I'm deeply indebted to all of you. Thank you, uh, okay. and uh, take care, and we'll meet again. Okay. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you.